Okay, so we're going to get started. It's uh, about 12 o'clock, so um, my name's uh, Jeff Weiscarver. I'm going to be your moderator today, and I wanted to start off by saying I wanted to thank you for your time today. I know that there's a numerous webinar opportunities, and you know, for you guys to give us your time, especially two hours on a Friday afternoon, I, you know, I think that's uh, phenomenal. I, I don't take that lightly and I'm grateful for your time today. And I wanted to also thank the, 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 the panelists today. We have a, a four phenomenal panelists today. And, you know, one of the, you know, there's some good things about pandemics. One of them is that it forces us to get together in, in, in environments like this more often. And that frees up uh, excellent people that would have ordinarily had to come together. So I know, for example, that uh, Dr. Miracle is in Georgia. Guy is in Florida. I don't know where Mark is. I think he's in Michigan, I'm not sure. And I'm in California. And so one of the things that we're gonna do because of that is we're gonna be handing off presentations. So as we transition from one person to another, there might be a little, you know, uh, transferring moment so just just you know be patient with that uh, we are going to be offering two hours of CE credit uh, for today's webinar and that's good I mean it's free and then another thing I wanted to mention is that we're going to be offering some special you know you know because you're attending you're going to be getting receiving some special offers for those that attend and so in the next few days you're going to be receiving a few emails from us uh, one of them is going to contain the, the uh, special offers because you attended. So be sure and pay attention to that because if there's things that you need and it's in the special offer, you can, you know, it'll be a good opportunity for you to pick up something that you would have probably picked up anyway. So with that being said, uh, I did want to mention that I encourage questions both during and then after. We'll kind of leave a few minutes at the end for questions. And I just want to make sure that everybody um, feels comfortable with uh, you know, sending those chat questions in or raising your hand or however you feel comfortable raising questions. So when I'm not talking, I'm going to be kind of tracking those uh, questions. And, you know, as appropriate, I'll either kind of jump in and, 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 and deal with the question or we'll save it for the, for the end, depending on the nature of the question. Okay. Disclosures. Okay, so because we're offering CEs, it's important that we, we mention uh, some disclosure statements. Um, this is uh, possible based on a few organizations getting together and providing us with some support. So ProSomnus, I wanted to thank that group. Kettenbach Dental USA, uh, they, were, they really stepped up. Uh, Practical Sleep Education, which uh, Dr. Miracle and I are involved with, and DS3X uh, is also gonna help us out. Now, in fact, actually a special thank you to them as they're gonna be the group that issues your, your CE, credit, CE credits for today. Okay. Uh, what are we gonna talk about today? Um, first, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have a, uh, a great speaker uh, Dr. Miracle and I have worked together for several years. Uh, we worked together, uh, we did, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 seminars for Glidewell. And mm -hmm. so, so we've done, you know, several of uh, seminars with them. Then after Dr. Miracle, we're going to move, uh, Dr. Yatros is going to talk about uh, some titration follow-up and office workflow, uh, which is critical in sleep. There's, uh, there's a lot of moving parts in a successful sleep practice. And, and Guy's just gonna talk about a lot of those moving parts and how to manage them. Uh, then we're gonna move on to Dr. Murphy and he's gonna talk about appliance selection. So that's gonna be cool. I mean, that's, that, I can't think of a better person to talk about that. I'm gonna spend a few minutes at the end. To, you know, I'm a kind of a technology nerd and uh, there's a, you know, I always like to find uh, a, an issue or a problem and then find a technology to address it. And so I have something really exciting that we're going to finish up with. So before we turn the session over to Dr. Um, Dr. Miracle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pop up a questionnaire. And 
the uh, so what I wanted to do is, and I'll I'll bring this up in just a second. Is I'm gonna we're gonna be talking about um, a series of questions during during the session. So we're actually gonna let Dr. Miracle go. I'll pull up those questionnaires, and then we'll we'll have a series of questions throughout the throughout the session. So with that being said, I am gonna go ahead and turn this over to. Uh, Dr. Miracle, and, and uh, go ahead and take over. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I just want to welcome everyone on this beautiful Friday here where I live. I um, want to thank you for taking time on Friday to be with us. I am a general dentist. I practice on St. Simon's Island, Georgia, and I am honored and humbled to be on this presentation with Mark and Guy and Jeff. So everyone, I hope you learned a lot today and be prepared to have fun today too. It's going to be relaxing. Okay, what I'm going to start with is airway metric system. Kettenbach offers an air metric system, which is an innovative way to measure for dentists who provide oral sleep appliances. The airway metric system also complements the impression material that goes with the bike registration. So it's kind of like an all-in-one shop for you. And what we're gonna talk about is the airway metric system and the bite registration with it. What it does first is it eliminates snoring. There's three components to go with this. To eliminate snoring, to establish an anterior and posterior registration, and to establish vertical. Okay, we're gonna see if we can turn these. <laughs> oh, cool. oh yeah, thanks, okay. Airway metrics is a system used to obtain an optimum treatment position for oral appliances. First, you're going to determine the optimal initial treatment position using the snore screener. Then the mandibular re repositioning keys, and it's known as um, MRK, the protrusive and vertical positions, and it's designed specifically for sleep medicine. So it makes taking the bite, getting the protrusive and vertical almost perfect for that appliance so you don't have to do a lot of adjusting if you're pretty accurate the first time. It allows for a great accurate fit. Then you're gonna confirm the vertical dimension that's effective once the appliance is placed with the vertical titration keys that are also in the system. And it's used to um, create two dimensions, which is the anterior posterior, the AP and the vertical. And you have to remember that the vertical position is just as important as protrusive. A lot of dentists get um, kind of confused when they just do the protrusive, they forget there's a vertical component that would help the patient's flow of air move you know, better and quicker, the patient's quality of sleep. And sometimes a patient cannot adjust to being out enough. So then you have to combine the vertical with that. Both dimensions can contribute to a therapeutic benefit the sleep apnea appliances, remember that you want at least a minimum of four millimeters on an oral appliance. So you have to remember that when you're doing the vertical. Also, the vertical puts less pressure on the teeth, so it's less risk of movement on the teeth. So you also have to think about that when, you're, when patients are talking about risk of wearing an appliance. They've heard the teeth move. They've heard of the pressure. They're scared to move their jaw forward too much because of the discomfort, TMJ, TMD. And also the AP tends to be more efficient therapeutically, but it also introduced more risk for the patient in the movement. That's why it's so important to follow up with your patients. Because as dentists, we are not you know, allowed to really diagnose. However, when we screen patients, we identify them and we recognize these patients. And then we want to, after we screen them, we want to be able to treat them once they have a diagnosis and to follow up. And that's where these positions where if you follow up with your patients on a regular basis, you can stop a lot of the tooth movement that occurs, a lot of the pain, the TMJ, TMD. So you have to kind of work with your patients and think about all of these different you know, dimensions when you are taking the bite. Also, airway metrics establishes the best position with the least risk. And it's really, I mean, simple to use in your practice. I mean, I do it every day. This is what I do. I'm a general dentist. I do sleep and I do a lot of other things with sleep. Sorry, my slider is going backwards. Okay, the first component we have is the snore screener. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna think about what is the point of the snore screener. So what you do is you put 
this key in, and this key that we're looking at on the slide, it will establish the optimal AP and vertical position using just this one key. So what you wanna do is you wanna have the patient open, and you usually, I start at the four millimeter, and this is gonna establish a vertical. So remember this, so you have the patient go, you know, bite down on it edge to edge, and you put the key in, and then you have the patients lay them back in your chair, because that's how they're gonna be, you know, in bed, sleeping. So you're gonna lay them back, and then you're gonna ask the patient to snore. And you want to give you your best snore. A lot of times, you may want to do, uh, do a snore, because I, I, I purr, I snore also, but I purr. So you may wanna do that first, and then have the patient do it, and you want them to give you your, the best snore that they can do. And so once they do it, if you have it at the four millimeters and they're snoring, so then you want to move it to the eight and have them give you their best snore. And if you can still hear it, you know, I don't really like to go to 12. So what I do is I use, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but in my practice, I use these, I don't know if you can see them, the, maybe you can see them, the mutes, and they're inserted into each, each of your nostrils. And so then I go back to the four with these in place on the patient and then I have the patient snore again. And if I still hear a little bit of a snore, then I'll move them to eight. And then if there's no snore, I'll probably go in between four and eight, maybe six millimeters. And these mutes, you know, I have them in my practice. Sometimes I give them away, sometimes I sell them. Just remember, um, there's also, um, on these mutes, I'm kind of going off the subject, they have little attachments that go on the side. Just tell your patients, do not remove those, or else you will be in your office with hemostats looking for them because you do everything when you're a dentist. So make sure they do that. So with the mutes in place, they may not be snoring at eight and 12 anymore because the mutes are opening up their airway. Okay, so now what you do, um, what I've already talked about without the snore screen, you ask the patient to snore again, start edge to edge at four millimeters and then ask the patient to snore. And you gotta listen very carefully. It's also great to have your assistant in there so they can listen as well and encourage the patient, you know, to snore. And what I like about the air metric system, many things I like, but the patient is participating in this. So they see the difference in their airflow. And most of these patients are usually mouth breathers that are that snoring and they're not using the nasal. So it also can explain what the patient's doing as well. Okay, I'm going backwards. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> get this right okay so you start you know at the national position natural position and go eight millimeters and ask the patient to snore again because the patient was snoring loudly at four so then they're snoring a little bit at eight that's when i go to the mutes and put those in place and ask the patient to snore again so if they're snoring between four and eight like i said before i would go to six then the second component that we're going to work with with the airway metric system is the mps the mandibular position simulators. And this is all in this metric air, you know, metric kit. So you have everything right there in front of you. So it's easy to work with. And what you'll do is you're using, um, on this case, you'll use the eight millimeter metrics. Okay, but you're gonna establish it at six, but you're gonna use the eight, and then you're gonna test with the patient, the two to three millimeter key, the four to six millimeter key, and the five to seven. So then you're gonna see where the patient is most comfortable, which position the patient is going to achieve the optimum airway and be comfortable with this position. Because if the patient is uncomfortable in the very beginning, they're not gonna be encouraged. And you want the patient to be positive about this experience so they're ready to get the appliance and go forward. And this is a patient in my practice where we did um, the, the snore screener and then we put in the MPS simulators to get their vertical and to get the anterior posterior position. And this is gonna give the patient the most accurate bite and registration so that this appliance will fit. And then we'll use something else to go through once the appliance is fitted to make sure that we are at the right dimensions and that this appliance is gonna be efficient for this patient. And it's an easy system. And you know, like I said, the patient you're putting in these tabs and the keys, and the patient is actively involved with this, they're participating. So they understand the importance of the protrusive. They understand the vertical dimensions. They understand why it needs to be done this way. So that a lot of patients, when you talk to them about a sleep appliance, they don't really understand um, 
what the function is or how is this going to help them sleep. They don't, you know, so if you can explain it to them and show them with, especially using the system, it's great for you and the patient. Hey, Jeff, hold on. Oh, sorry, it won't work again. <laughs> Okay, let me see if I can get this going. Okay, oh, here we go. Okay, this when we take the bite registration. So when we did the snore screening, and remember, we put the key in, had the patient snore. They were snoring at four. We put the key in. They were snoring at eight. And then I didn't want to go to 12, so I backed them back up, and I used the mutes. So they were using their nose, really, their airway, their nasal airway to breathe, so they weren't depending on their mouth and the airway coming through the flow. So we did that, so we went back. And then I used the MPS simulator keys and that established the protrusive. So right now we're at vertical of six and then protrusive of three. And this is going to give us a great position for this appliance and the guidance that the system provides for us makes it easy for the dentist to do this and to get a great you know, achievement and a great result at the end. So what you're gonna do here is you are going to attach the bite fork and the handle to each side of the key. There's a slot for each, so it goes right inside, and then you're ready to take the patient's bite. And, sorry, okay. And there's certain material, and that's the one good thing about Kettenbach. They introduce this airway system, and they also have the material that you need to take the bite registration. So it's one place you can go for everything. And they have the futar, and this is the anterior material that you're gonna use. And it comes in different um, hardnesses. There's different setting stages and different hardness. So you have different materials to use. And it's a silicone material. And the bite registration also for the posterior portion of the bite registration is Panacil. And it's a putty. And you use both. You take a scoop of each from each tub and you roll it, you know, rub it together. And then it just gives you another great impression material. And it's pretty accurate too. And you also have to remember that when you're using these materials, you want the setting to be as short as possible because the patient does not like doing this. And you need the putty together. And to complete um, your bite registration, you're gonna need the futar and the putty, and then you're gonna do the anterior material and the posterior, and this is gonna be measured and give you the right measurements for the anterior posterior dimension and the vertical dimension. And remember that both of these are important dimensions. And you have to remember that just as you can relate it to the sleep cycle, all of those, the sleep cycles are important as well. And so both of these dimensions are important. And so now you're ready to take your impression. And, you know, I usually do the impressions and my assistant, you know, helps me. She gets all the material together. And I just like to make sure that the patient is biting, you don't want to, them to let go of the metrics because it's small and it goes right in between the teeth, edge to edge. You also, um, you know, the patient's laying back, so you don't want them to, you know, you know, in, inhale and swallow the metrics key. So make sure that you hang on to it or warn the patient. Like we take a lot of photos of the patients. So we try to tell them to, you know, hold on to it, keep it, do not open their mouth because they can swallow it. You know, I mean, you don't want a patient to swallow that. So just make sure you warn them, but it's best to hold on to it. Sometimes my assistant will do that for me. And so when you're taking the impression, this is important as well. Just as when we do any kind of impression in our office, whatever you send to the lab is what you are going to get back. So if you send an impression that has bubbles or voids, they're going to send you similar to what you sent them. So you want to have no bubbles, no voids, because also you don't want it to, um, you know, cause any problems with getting the accurate, accurate bite registration. So make sure, you know, the gingival margins, make sure you can see everything in the impression, just like you do a crown, you know, if you're not scanning, if you're taking impressions, make sure what you turn in is what you want back. Because that, that's how the lab determines honestly, what type of dentist and what type of practice you have. So you want to send everything out of your office as nice as you'd like to receive it. And so then once the appliance is delivered, you have, they're called vertical titration keys. And what this does is this confirms the vertical dimension 
dimension used in these keys. So once the appliance is seated, you want to make sure that the patient, you know, can't snore. And there again, remember that snoring does not mean that the appliance is working. Because some patients are still going to snore, but that doesn't determine if the appliance is working all the way like it should. So remember that it's not only snoring that indicates, but it's a good start. So you want to make sure that the vertical dimension is correct with this appliance when the vertical titration keys are tested on this patient. Okay, Suzanne, I'm going to jump in yep. here real quick. Um, yep. I'm going to jump in here real quick because okay. we have a, 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 a Joe uh, has a couple of questions on this particular part of the conversation. So uh, one of one of his questions is: Is the protrusive measure rest or edge to edge? Okay, that's a good question. Number one, if the patient is already edge to edge, then you're going to have the patient move out just a tiny bit. But if the patient is at rest and they have some movement, then you can do them edge to edge. So either way, but you're going to have the patient move out because you're going to be either at four millimeters, you know, eight, 12. So that's when you're going to turn the, the vertical. However, then when you do the keys to match the vertical, you're going to have them remember the two to three, four to six, and et cetera. So you're going to have to have the patient move out to get in those keys. And you always are going to use the incisor, the anterior incisor teeth to do it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and Joe has one other question. Um, why do you use the putty for the posteriors and not the bite registration material? Well, you use the um, putty for it because it's going to give you a firm, accurate bite because you don't want anything moving when you have that, when you establish that bite, you want it to make the trip to the lab and back. So that's why you use that on the posterior and then you use the fruit tar on the anterior. Okay, all right. Um, okay. And he's got one more comment here. He said, uh, you lost me with using incisors. Not sure. What oh, your incisor teeth, that, your incisor teeth. You're going to use that bite and they're gonna be, you're gonna, bite down on the maxillary mandibular incisors. Okay. Right. Does that answer? Yes, so sorry if I confused you, but that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna use the bite. It's really the centrals almost that you're gonna use, but that's how you're gonna determine the bite. There's notches on the keys that you may not have ever see if you want me to go back to those slides. There's notches so that you're gonna place that in place on the patient. If you go back to the, keep going. Oh, you can see the notch, yeah. You can see, but see right there, there's a notch. And you can see that. Go back, Jeff. Like, I think you got it. Go back, yeah, see where the patient, well, that one's it. But see right there where the notches are and they're edge to edge right there. But you're gonna have to move out if you're gonna use the two to three, the four to six, and the five to seven. The patient's gonna have to move out and you're gonna talk to the patient and make sure it's comfortable for them to move out. It's just like if you took an impression, a bite registration with, um, I know in the very beginning, when I first started sleep, I didn't really have the George gauge. I just kind of was doing it kind of, I just decided one day to start doing it. And I used like two syringe um, suction tips. And I had the patient just move out a little bit. And then what I had the patient do is just from reading literature is I had the patient snore with those two um, syringes in their mouth. And I just had to move out a little bit at a time. And then I tried to measure where I need to open them up a little bit vertical. And that's not really a great way to do it because then you have to titrate and it's, it doesn't work as easy. So this is a perfect system. I mean, there's a lot of tools that I have in my toolbox as a dentist. And this is one that every dentist really, I mean, to me, it's my personal opinion, but that they need. It's an easy way to do sleep. And this is the one of the reasons I think dentists don't do sleep because they try to reinvent the wheel. And, you know, just like with medical insurance or trying to get the patients in, you know, there's just a way to start doing it and you should make it easy for you and your patients to establish, you know, a great result at the end. And this works well in my office. It works well in my hands. Everybody has a different system. Everybody has a favorite system, but that's what you use. You're going to use the, the front teeth and you're going to go into the notches. Does that answer? Any more questions, Jeff? Let's see here. Nope, that's it. Okay, great. Okay, because we're gonna have a test at the end of this. You have to pass it to get your CE credits, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm out um, paddle boarding this afternoon. <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of. Okay, Jeff, help me. Okay, so the appliance is delivered. 
and you're gonna use the vertical titration keys. And this is really a great way to check if you have the vertical dimension. Sometimes you use a, you know, I'm not gonna mention any other bytes, but sometimes you use a different byte registration and then you are kind of having to measure to make sure you achieve the right vertical dimension, which can, you know, make or break you with an appliance if the patient is going to be compliant and if the physician with you is going to refer other patients to you because you had such a great result. So that's important too for, a pay, for dentists to follow up because you want that when they go back to their physician, you want to have good results and you want to make sure that you have, you know, verified everything before you send them. So when the physician hooks them up to um, a pulse ox or the circle, that you are going to have great results coming back and that physician is going to send you more patients. That's how it works. And it's a good way to do. So once the initial titration option, you're gonna, once the appliance is fitted, is to check the vertical dimension by asking the patient if they can snore with the appliance in place. If they still can snore, then you are going to take the vertical titration key in the anterior opening right there. Do you see it on the slide? Right where the front is, right where the incisors are. That's where you're always measuring, protrusive, um, you know, vertical. And then you're gonna see, and then you're gonna ask the patient, once you've increased the vertical dimension again, you're gonna see if the patient is snoring again. And if you see a reduction in snoring, then, then you're going to place a certain amount of acrylic on the appliance to achieve that corresponding amount of vertical. And so by using the vertical, though, instead of the protrusive, you, you know, decrease the risk of damage for tooth movement, jaw movement, you know, jaw discomfort, and TMD symptoms. And I know I'm going off the subject again, but this is what I do in my practice. So I want you to be able to do this and think outside the box. So when a patient comes in and says they, the appliance gave them TMJ or TMD, they, it probably didn't happen. It probably just brought it out more. That's why another important issue is to discuss with the patient before the appliance is, do they have any jaw issues? Do a TMJ exam on them. You know, palpate the muscles you know, do all the, you know, procedures that you need to do, a thorough TMJ exam, if you, you know, you know, see any reason for that. If you see, you know, a general um, attrition, a fraction in their mouth when you're doing their exam, talk to your patients, find out if they have a problem, and that'll eliminate you getting a headache afterwards or being blamed for something that you really were not responsible for. So, um, you know, it's important too to ask the patient, if they find it more difficult to breathe, because you want to keep the airflow, airflow going as well. So there's a lot of components, there's a lot of dimensions, but this is an easy system to follow. And um, you know, I hope that you understand. If you don't, you can always um, ask me questions here. You can email me. I'm available a lot on my email or phone, and I will respond. Okay, we have a couple questions, so okay. I'm going to jump in here again. Um, oh, we're moving on to okay, so. Uh, do you add acrylic uh, to prosonus appliances if you want to increase the vertical? That might be a question for Mark. That would be a question for Mark, because I was going to mention that you need to talk to the lab first, because they may remove any warranty if you touch the appliance. So Mark should answer that, probably. Yeah, so I'll be happy to answer that. I when, when, uh, And it's interesting, because I've used airway metrics. I used, for years, I've used Kettenbach materials, love them, so and I wish they would pay me something for doing that. <laughs> giving them a plug, but uh, their impression materials are like half the cost of all the others, and they're incredibly accurate. So I've used them for a long time. So I love that stuff. Love the airway metrics whenever I'm using vertical, and I don't always add that vertical component. So you and I both are. We've talked about this. You and I are very comfortable talking about the fact that we think the bite relationship is three dimensional. It's not two dimensional. It's three dimensional. So we always have to be thinking about how much horizontal and how much vertical. And, and the question is, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And we could that we could argue about all day, but it doesn't matter. We both believe it's three dimensional. So when I go to add vertical, I jump to the airway metric system. No question about that. But sometimes, and this is a great question, Bob. Uh, not, not Bob, I'm sorry. This is a, a yeah. Joe, great question. So um, sometimes I've, I've built a device, and, and I've taken the patient out anteriorly, and I take them a little bit further, and, man, the HI is just not coming down, or the snoring's not stopping, or something like that. So all I keep thinking in the back of my mind is, I probably need to add a little bit of vertical. And that's exactly what I do. I use two pieces of uh, rope wax or boxing wax, uh, roughing up the surface of the prosomnus device, it is polymethyl methacrylate. Now it's control cured, it's milled, so it's a very, very dense, um, very, very strong material. So it doesn't look or act like regular PMMA, but it is chemically the same material. I roughen up the occlusal surface, I build a landing area that's maybe, 
oh, an inch long and is ever as wide as the occlusal surfaces in the posterior bilaterally. And I box that out with some wax and I build it up to the approximate height I want and then adjust it if I need to. So I will add in that posterior segment two or four millimeters. And sometimes I'll add it in the anterior. Sometimes I'll add it in the posterior bilaterally. It depends on the patient and what I think they're going to tolerate better in their teeth and some other things like that that we can talk about in device selection. But I add that to the device. I don't think prosomnus would ever question the warranty of the device if something happened to it, if you had added acrylic to open the vertical. If you had ground away the facial to make it thinner, to get better lip closure, to answer somebody else's question that they had, if you ground that thin in the anterior and it broke in the anterior, you, they might say, well, you know, it probably broke because it wasn't made to specifications in design. You might have an argument that you'd lose there. But if you added acrylic to the occlusal surface, I don't think prosomnus would care at all. So I think you'd be fine. And I've added acrylic, oh, probably, five or six times a year where I've got to increase the vertical. Works out great. The only problem is that acrylic doesn't look as nice as the rest of the acrylic. And I warn the patient of that. I go, this is a lot easier than making you a new one. A lot less expensive for you too. That's what I tell them. Okay, we have two more questions. Uh, one from Robert. And Robert's asking, what happens if you cannot get lip closure? If you can't get lip closure on the appliance? Yeah. Okay. Well, there are different options that you can use because that's our main goal is to get, you know, achieve lip closure. So first of all, you could look and see if you needed to add um, rubber bands to help keep you closed mm -hmm. and then have, be able to pull the lip over it. And sometimes the, the patient, you know, they need to, I tell them like, um, and I kind of like bring things into life, but you know, like if you use Vaseline on your teeth, like I used to, when I first started presenting, I would use it to make you smile, <laughs> it slides off. So you can use Vaseline on the outside of your lips. You can use a chin strap to help you keep closure on an appliance. You need to measure before you adjust the appliance or do anything, then you need to make sure that the vertical and protrusive, sometimes the patient's um, lips, you've got to learn how to do it. So I also recommend that the patient wear it sometimes during the day and practice keeping their lips over it. But I know um, I'm a mouth breather, so a lot of times when I use my appliance, if I'm traveling, if I'm lecturing, if I'm just worn out from whatever, I know that it's gonna be hard to keep my mouth closed that night because I'm really sleepy. So I put, I mean, I have a chin like strap on, I have my appliance, I have my mutes, but I'm still sexy, so remember to tell your patient <laughs> that, okay? Still looking good if you remember to take them out in the morning before you walk out into the kitchen. Suzanne, you'd always, you'd always be attractive. Mark or Guy, you might have another suggestion how to keep their lips. I do. Closed. I do. One of the things that, and I do this probably um, six nights out of seven, is I tape my mouth shut. Yeah, I, use, uh, I use what's called Metapore. Good. I just typed it into the comment section, the answers. I use um, um, Metapore, M-E-D-I-P-O-R-E, tape by 3M. I use a one-inch square. I pull it across my lips. And the reason I do it, I like the idea of having better nasal breathing so that I don't cheat and breathe through my mouth. So I like that idea, nasal breathing, nitric oxide. We can all talk about that stuff till, till the cows come home. But honestly, I hate waking up with a dry mouth in the front. And so I find if I tape, and I know a lot of people, I talk to almost every patient that if they do have lip competency problems, there's a lot of solutions. We can put elastics on. We can have them practice it earlier, like you said. But what I go, what I do is I tape my mouth. And most of them go, tape, you tape your mouth. Ooh, that's weird. Oh, I feel so claustrophobic. I go, no, nah, you can actually breathe through the tape if you have to. But I go, it's actually very comfortable to get used to it. And they go, really? I go, oh, yeah, you can put it on even before you go to bed. I go, sometimes I put it on and I lean over to kiss my wife goodnight with this piece of white tape here. And she looks at me like, you idiot. 42 <laughs> mirrors, 42 years to my high school sweetheart. So she puts up with it. But Metapore tape for me, I don't get a dry mouth. I get perfect lip closure. Uh, and even if I had elastics, because of some devices have a little bit of bulk to them in the anterior, and that will still prevent you from having good lip closure, especially when you're in a relaxed posture in sleep. So I think taping's an awesome option. So the good news too is if they do wake up with a dry mouth, if I, if I couldn't tape, if I couldn't get rid of the dry mouth, dry mouth and not having good lip closure is okay as long as I have an open airway and I don't have obstructive sleep apnea anymore. That's critical. We have to always keep that problem. Keep your priorities up. This is an acceptable side effect, but there are some things we can do for you. Yep. And I agree, the tape is a good thing to use. Okay, so we have a, another quick question. That's great. I, I, the questions are phenomenal, guys. I, I appreciate it. So is this more reliable than phonetics technique? Um, to me, and this is my personal opinion, yes, it is to me. With the appliance, because just like Mark just mentioned, you got to cut your priorities where they are. You need to have an airway. Your airway needs to be of good quality, and that you need to have that flow. 
So to me, this is, I've used several bike registrations. Um, I've been doing this probably not as long as you know they have, but I've been doing it a long time. And I find this is easy to teach, the air metrics, easy to use, and you have great results afterwards. But like I said, everyone has their own opinion. And it's just like when you, um, if any of you are general, you know, different materials that you use in your hands, what works best for you? And sometimes you have to think outside the box. And I have found that with sleep, you do have to think outside the box a little bit. And you just have to see what works for you. And Mark also mentioned different patients um, require different, you can't use the same thing for every patient. Just like he said for his vertical, sometimes he uses the anterior, sometimes the posterior. You have to do different things for different patients because different patients, you know, our patients are people and they're not the same and not everything works for one person. But thank goodness, a lot of things do work for a lot of people, but you always have that, you know, that patient, just like when you do dentures, you got to be careful of who you choose to do dentures on, or you're going to be married mm -hmm. to them for the rest of your life, whether you want to or not. <laughs> so, Suzanne, the only thing I would I like add to that, that would be... But Mark that, might have something to say. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to that is the phonetic bite is an outstanding technique, but the phonetic bite is not really designed for uh, treating obstructive sleep apnea and finding an open airway position. It's designed for treating temporomandibular disorders, and finding a position that's down and forward of the condyles from a TMD standpoint. So sometimes that bite is the same position. Uh, sometimes that bite is down and forward about the same, and then we'll want a little bit more rotation and openness like you're taking with your vertical bite here with Aerometrics. So the phonetic bite is great for a daytime device, it's great for a TMD device, but we don't usually see it as being as predictable for opening the airway as we do when we take the other kinds of bites that are out there and available to us uh, for obstructive sleep apnea. So I hope that answers. It's a great bite, but it's for kind of different use, use case in dentistry. And I agree with that too. It's not really meant to open the airway. And right. that's what you're trying to achieve. It's a more airway friendly bite for right. sure. Mm -hmm. It's more airway friendly, but it's not an airway opening kind of bite. Okay. Maybe. So, so yeah. uh, what I'd like to do now is we're going to transition to our next uh, panelist. Uh, Gayatros, and we've been looking at his picture and bio for a little bit. So I'm just going to uh, tell you that I've been working with, with Guy in various in activities for many years. And one thing I will say, if you haven't heard him talk before, you, if, or I would more accurately say, if you haven't experienced his lectures, uh, he's a very funny, affable person, very likable um, and sometimes it masks the, the cleverness and the smartness of, his, of what he's saying. So I invite you to be very careful and listen careful, carefully to what he's saying because there's a lot of experience. And the thing that I uh, probably hold at higher esteem than anything else is, is where the rubber meets the road, where that experience comes in. And, and Guy has tons of that. So uh, Guy, go ahead and it, 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 you're up. I guess I should thank you for that. I'm not real sure. Uh, I think he just... Uh, Said I don't sound real smart, but I is, I think is what he's saying there. Uh, <laughs> and I've been very quiet here, which is odd for me. I understand. I was having a little internet connection. And then we were talking about bite registrations, and my mother taught me not to talk about religion, politics, or bite registrations um, uh, in, in public because it's, it's a very – you could do this a lot of different ways. It's, it's like talking about TMD. Uh, there's, there's a lot of camps out there. And the one thing I can tell you, I agree that, can you all can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, my, my internet was bouncing back and forth. I switched to my phone. Uh, one thing I can tell you is I agree there's a vertical component, there's an anterior poster component, and there's a component uh, that we don't have today, in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, we don't have a way of knowing where that position is before we try it out. Uh, I mean, we have the matrix, which helps us with the anterior poster, but it doesn't do anything with the vertical at this point. Uh, and so we can use snore techniques, we can use pharyngometers, we can use our gut instinct after doing thousands of these devices, uh, and we can get a pretty good spot to start with. But we don't know where the best spot is ahead of time. And anybody who tells you 100% of the time I can find that, uh, they're just not telling you the truth. I don't think anybody out here is saying that either. We're just trying to find a good starting spot. And so my philosophy on it is I'm more worried about the follow-up, and especially with some of the things I'm gonna teach you here in the next few minutes, that that's become so much easier that maybe it doesn't matter where we start so much. If we've got a quick way 
and predictable way to test this device at multiple positions, then, then the trying to find the sweet spot to start with is maybe not so important. Uh, the one thing that we can't mess with on our devices very readily is it's vertical. So yes, you gotta kind of make a decision. I, I try to make a decision vertical before I start. And, and then I, I, I honestly don't mess with it much after that because I'm old and too tired to mess with it for the most part, um, because all that takes a little bit of work and sometimes it doesn't pay off. A lot of times it doesn't pay off and sometimes it does. So I try to make that decision. And I think the airway metrics kit for helping determine it's people that need to be open more. But I use the little thing between my ears sometimes too. I look in there, you look at the bite and if there's just not enough room for the tongue, uh, everything's their patients still looks like they're choking even at that vertical then you might want to open them up a little bit more. So trying to figure out that vertical ahead of time is, is, is good. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the systems you need in place to do this and, and really the follow-up after that. If we can streamline that, it really doesn't matter. So just go conservative and we'll find the vertical component uh, as I walk you through what we do here uh, today. So thanks uh, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with my colleagues and I, I know real well, I've known Suzanne for, for a while and uh, Mark I've known for 20 years now and been my friend and mentor and down at the Pank Institute. So I'm always thrilled to get the, to be anywhere with, 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 with the likes of the, these people. Jeff, thank you for the introduction. I'm not sure how I advanced this. I, I, I took control and I'm hitting my forward key. Do I just have to tap the screen? Did that do it? Uh, were you controlling it earlier? I thought I was, but I don't know what I was doing. Uh, oh, there we go. I think, I think I hit up here in the little orange box. Maybe that did it. So let me hit it again, see if that moves us on here. It's, it's got a little bit of delay, doesn't it? Uh, I just, I don't, there's no like advance button that I see. I think you have to re request the control. I think I have, it says you can't control. It says I can. But then I don't know how to move it forward. There's no. Do you have an arrow key on your keyboard? Yeah, that's what I was hitting. And oh, okay. And how about your mouse? Okay, when I hear that noise, I'll just move your slide. There you go. I don't have that many slides. Yeah. So yeah, I'll just tell you to move slides. That's that's fair enough. It's okay. Not that many. And my slides aren't that important. Uh, so I think mostly what you want to get is the message here. Uh, I don't know the the level of everyone's dental sleep education. So this may be repetitive for some, but I think if you've been doing this for any length of time, you will realize dental sleep has a lot of moving parts. And I like to say dental sleep is not difficult. There's nothing difficult compared to dentistry. I mean, making dentures, doing root canals, doing a DO composite's difficult. I mean, technically it takes skill. It takes years to learn how to do that. Each step of dental sleep is, is fairly, Simple, but there's a lot of moving parts. So I like to say it's complex, simple, but complex. And so you've got a lot of pieces that you've got to get to fit together and you can advance the slide. Uh, if, if one of them's missing, we will find that, the, that, that you fail at, at, at your goals for dental sleep. What I do, I guess a little introduction, I've been doing this for 20 years in my own practice. For the last seven years, that's all I've been doing in my three offices. We just do sleep and a little bit of TMD. And then I spend most of my time training other dentists how to do this through our DS3 systems. We've trained, trained thousands and thousands of dentists. And do they all succeed? No, uh, they don't. Uh, not to our standards, even to their standards. They all want to, but sometimes they don't make it because one of these systems isn't in place. They don't take the time to, to get the systems or get the team members to implement the system. So you can advance the slide. Uh, and so at a high level, we talk about the four pillars of dental sleep. I think you might have to click the button. I, I, there may be, four, there it came up, perfect. And we, we call this screen testing, treating, and billing. And so I always tell people that want to get involved in dental sleep, write down in your to-do list three months from now or whatever time in the future that you want to be at a certain level. Say, I want to be doing three devices a month or five devices or 50, whatever you think your, your goal is. And have it pop up in your calendar. And or, am I there? And if you're not, then at a high level, you're not doing something on the screen. Either you don't have a system to screen your patients uh, that's working well, or you don't have a system to test your patients that's working well, or you don't have a system to treat them, or you don't have a system to get paid. Okay, so that's pretty obvious, but then you're gonna have to dive a little deeper and see where the problems are. And I can tell you most of the time it's in the first two or maybe the last one. 
I think dentists, uh, all this talk about the bite registration and all that, I think it's, it, it, it's worth talking about and the, the devices we're going to select. But a lot of dentists never make it to that point uh, because they, they've, they get stopped at the screening, testing, uh, or, 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 or billing part of this, and, and we don't get to, to the treat part. You can advance it there if you want. Yep. So let me, let me talk about this perfect. That's great. We'll talk about screening for a minute. And the reason I say that is we probably know that the people on the, on the call here today, that one in five adults pushing one in four have obstructive sleep apnea. So this isn't guy's number. This is not something we made up and, uh, and, and, and pulled out of the air. This are, these are real numbers in our country and it's a really big problem. I, I, I say a really bold statement about this that even makes me uncomfortable as I say it, but it's true, so that's why I can say it. Obstructive sleep apnea is our country's most significant chronic, undiagnosed, untreated medical disorder. I have to throw chronic in there since, pand since the pandemic came around. So I used to just say it was our country's most significant, undiagnosed, untreated medical disorder. There's nothing else that's this bad for you that this many people have that, wants, that, that aren't successfully treated. So one in five have it and it's killing people. And so if you can't make this work in your practice, we've got to figure out why. And it starts with identifying these patients. So you can advance the slide. And so part of a system you need to have is a, is a system to screen all of your patients. And what do I mean by that? Well, we need to evaluate every patient in your practice for their risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, so is it at, does this person at risk? How do we do that? Mostly with questionnaires. I think if you advance it, I think I have a slide of our questionnaire. Uh, we can talk to you. I'll, I'll mention at the end what we do at DS3 to help you with this, but you don't have to have uh, DS3 to do that. I think it advanced on its own, so don't worry about it. Like I said, slides aren't, aren't that important. Uh, the, you need a system to, to quickly, and within about five minutes or even two minutes, you can usually do this, to see who's at risk. And then once you decide what system you're gonna use, you need to decide who am I going to assess? Well, the answer is everyone in your practice, even children, which I don't talk as much about, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll focus on the adults here. And are you gonna do all new patients when they come in, all your hygienists? I think people get bogged down if they have two or three hygienists, they don't know where to start. So maybe you start with one hygienist or your new patients and you need to assess their risk. Uh, and if they're at high risk, then you move, move on to the next. Now you're gonna miss some people along the way that maybe you're medium risk if you have a, a screening system. But you know uh, those you hopefully will pick up by using your brains and when you're crowning number three and they're gagging, maybe even though they assess low that you'll say, wow, maybe this person's having trouble breathing. We'll hopefully find them that way as well. But there's easy systems out there. We have a, a system through DS3 that is in our cloud software. We actually are uh, uh, gonna have a, a, a screening system available uh, to people can put on their websites and use to anybody um, uh, very, very shortly that we're actually, we bring into market within the next couple of months. Uh, so there's no shortage of having screening systems. And so once a person's at risk, I think most offices can do that. And I don't have a slide here, but the American Dental Association as of 2017 in October came out and said, it's our jobs to do that. That we as dentists are in the best position to assess the risk of, of patients for having obstructive sleep apnea. And it's our job to, to assess them and to implement them getting tested. So I think once you embrace that in your practices, everything becomes easier. And if you don't embrace that, you'll have difficulty because the patients are gonna come in and say, well, I'm just here to have my teeth clean. You ever heard that one, Suzanne? When you yeah. talk to your patients, I'm just here to have my teeth clean. You, you run a general dental practice too now. And they, they're, they're, they're gonna ask you, right? Why, why are you doing this? And you have to be comfortable, you and your team, that this is my job to do it, just like looking at periodontal disease or oral cancer or anything else that we may look at. So um, once you get the, the people who are at risk, you need a system for testing. And I can tell you that right now, this is a moving target that is improving as we speak. Um, I like to uh, mention that you all don't know how good you have it, because when I started doing this, the only way to get people tested was what? You go to the sleep lab, be strapped up with 16 leads. I mean, I've known Jeff about that long when we first started talking. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a great way to gather a lot of data. Is that a really a great way to see how someone's sleeping on a regular basis? I, I, I think not. I've thought not for years. Uh, now, sleep testing has come a lot more available. I know that Jeff's going to talk about this, this, this uh, uh, circle a home monitor. 
Uh, there's two reasons why the testing's become uh, really plays into the dental sleep market. One is getting patients diagnosed, but the other is to see how well our device is working. Even when sleep tests first came out, the first home unit I bought was about six thousand something dollars, and it would test for one night at a time. And so you'd test somebody for one night, maybe uh, couldn't even use it for diagnosis at the time. We're talking about titrations right now. Uh, their AHI went from 20 to 15. Well, let's move them more forward. Let's test them again. Let's move them more forward. Let's test them again. It was a laborious process that took weeks and weeks and months. And I don't even think we got to the best endpoint by doing that either, because we just got tired of messing with it. We, we only had so many pieces of equipment we can do that with. The availability now of inexpensive tests. Um, Jeff's going to talk to you about a, a, a machine, a, the screen that they can wear home for a month. I can I can dial that 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 device in very readily, which I'll explain in just a few moments about the test. From a diagnostic point of view, things have gotten a lot better just since March. Uh, just since March, uh, the president opened up uh, telemedicine visits as essentially being the same as uh, going into a, a doctor's office. So now we're working with three different companies and we're trying to work out the work protocols because this is all fairly new to where now someone is at risk. We refer them to a telemedicine doctor. The doctor, telemedicine doctor meets them on the computer. They say, yes, you're at risk. They order a sleep test. That sleep test is delivered to that patient's home. The patient wears the sleep test. The, 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 the unit comes back or some of these uh, units are disposable now so they don't even ship them back to the doctors. The data goes to the cloud. The sleep physician now reads that and we have a diagnosis. So with some of the companies we're working with, if someone walks in my office, I can get them to see a doctor and have a sleep test completed and the doctor deliver to my office a diagnosis within a week. And that you know didn't happen before. Uh, you'd have to find your doctor down the street to refer them to, you'd have to build relationships. And so the testing part of this has become a very much uh, uh, um, streamlining and much easier for dentists. You as a dentist might be able to hand these, these, these devices to your patient yourself in some states and, and have a doctor read it. But I, I'm kind of bypassing that even now in my own office because why not do the telemedicine visit now that that's been, that's been opened up? So um, I see a chat down here, is that to me? Oh, okay. I think we're good. If you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, and we have ways through our system, DS3. So our company is named Dental Sleep Solutions. Our product is DS3. DS3 stands for Dental Sleep Solutions Software. And so we have a cloud-based software uh, and the X is for our, our experience where we train you. Uh, and we can order sleep tests right through our software with a click of a button. All that happens with the telemedicine visit now and all the data comes right back into our software within a week. So all I have to do is a, in my office is click a button. I'll have to gather some information first, which we already gathered from our consultation, so questionnaires and medical insurance and so forth. But man, I can't tell you how streamlined this is. To the point, uh, Mark, uh, I don't know if I even shared this with you. I think I've always mentioned that I, I like to market towards CPAP intolerance because these people already have diagnosis. We're starting a campaign. I'm writing a television ad. We're starting an internet campaign. I'm going to start marketing towards the people who just want to not go into the lab for a sleep test. C come to us. We can get you tested, treated. Yeah, and most, most of all this from the comfort of your own home because we're doing virtual consultations now too. And so um, I I'm excited uh, about that aspect just since the last three months. Uh, it's lowered the bar, the barrier for you dentists and myself out there doing this. So um, do you have anything you want to say on that, Mark? I know you, you've started doing some things with that. You know, no, I'm 100% behind you on that. You know, as, as, you, as you know, I use your software. The platform's incredible. Able to order these sleep tests out. I love what you're doing from a marketing direct to consumer because the, the patient awareness and even sometimes the physician awareness of oil appliance therapy just isn't what it should be. So kudos to you for doing that. Outstanding. Yeah, so th this part is, I mean, you know, I, I think I was only supposed to talk for 15 minutes. So I'm probably already over, so I'll, I'll move on. Uh, I'm going to give you my contact at the end here so you can get a hold of us. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. The, uh, we have a system for, for all this. Uh, the testing part for the diagnostic part has been, has been – I've spent hours revamping that just since March because of the changes. And, man, it's going great in our own office too. Uh, I can get someone now that from, 
phone call to impressions, which by the way, we use scans. I want to think uh, uh, while we're on the treatment thing, I'll, I'll mention how I do the, the bite. Uh, we can do that in a week time. And that used to take weeks to months to uh, do it. We do scan, we do an intro scanner. We have the CareStream 3600. I think Mark had to one up me and he has the 3700, of course. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> gotta always one up me, I can see how you are. But uh, uh, that's one we use, I'm sure you have your own. Uh, just my take home on it, we don't use any impression material or bite registration. Uh, you can use that airway metrics, just like Suzanne uh, showed you with just getting it where you want it. And you can just take the wand back there and marry the two arches together. Or uh, you can use a George gauge the same way. So you, uh, I know some people still use the putty with the scanners, maybe some scanners you need it, but I can tell you for doing it for almost two years now, you're wasting time and money by using that material. And Mark's shaking his head too. Uh, you don't use any material when you do it either, right? No. Awesome, uh, awesome way to do it. So uh, not that we don't like our friends at Kettenbach because we, you know, we used, I used to use their putty, their material as well. I think they have the great, great impression material. And if you're mm -hmm. gonna use bite registration, I, I use theirs as theirs as well. And the airway metrics work really well for these scanners because it's small. I mean, you can do it with a George gauge and you can do it, do it the pro gauge and an andro gauge or the somno gauge, but they're bigger. That airway metrics, what happens to the other ones, your wand hits the gauge as you're trying to marry them and it, it knocks it off. And so the airway metrics is ideally suited for this uh, digital bite registration with no material that we do literally every day in my office. So. Uh, Suzanne, you're, you're talking. We can't hear you. You're muted. I was doing something. Sorry. Oh. Um, I said I scan everything to the bite. I really don't use a lot of impression material and we'll, anymore. Yeah. But yeah. I did. Yeah, we did too. And that was I what we did. myself and then I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I usually do a lot of times do a survey when I do these courses. Uh, and it's getting more and more. It's still less than half, though. Most of the time when I, when I say, you know, I, I, we do polls and stuff and uh, it's usually 30, 30% 30 maybe. So most of you still out there doing impressions, which is fine. It works great. I think the scanner, uh, for, from my point of view, paid for itself because of the amount of money I was spending on material, even at the reduced amount, Kettenbach, uh, fee, uh, their, their amounts are definitely less. But when you do, you know, 500 impressions, uh, 400 impressions a year, you just take that the times 30 or 40 in impression, whatever your, your dollar is there, uh, and then what your payment or how much that cost you. It, it literally was free when you look at it from, from a cost flow point of view. Oh, you, can, you can advance the slide. So when it comes to treatment, I, uh, it, it really comes down, you gotta break these four pillars into more steps. And you have to have systems in place. And you, you, I don't know why that thing keeps wants to advance. I think it's on auto advance, but it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, I think it should stay on there now. Uh, you, you have to have systems in place and then you have to have team members responsible for each of these steps. And I think both of those are important. Some people say they get a system and they try to get their dental assistant who's already pulling their hair out and have a hundred other things to do to do all this. If they don't have time to do it, they're going to put it at the end of the list. And they're not going to do it. So oftentimes you're best served by having uh, one a, a team member who does the majority of this and then that's their job and they can be accountable. Oftentimes it requires hiring someone additional, but that person will pay for themselves over and over again. So you gotta have a system to screen your patients, to see who's at risk. We already talked about the testing. They gotta have a, a, an effective consultation and be prepared. And we could talk for hours about the information you need ahead of time and what you say during that. I can say we're doing 100% of these now virtually and they're actually going better for everyone involved. Uh, for, for, for us, it's, it's less time. For the patients, it's less time. We're getting more people to say yes to treatment. It's, it's, it's really, and I, I don't foresee us ever changing that going forward. You need a system to do some an exam. So we do need to have patients come in and impressions or scans. You gotta have a system for delivery. And uh, now maybe that's your, your, your clinical assistant and the rest is done by this other team. member. Now you gotta have some follow-up. That's what I'm gonna talk to you about briefly before I'm finished and then, then annual recall. All those steps used to take me several hours of guy's time, Dr. Yatros's time, the dentist time. Uh, when I first started doing this 20 years ago. Uh, now I can do this usually in my office under 30, 30 minutes or under of my time, but we tell most offices 45 minutes of the doctor's time if you have trained team members to do this. So think about the production you can add to your practice because you, the dentist, doesn't have to be doing lots of this. Okay, you can advance that, Jeff. And so I think this really plays into, I knew that we were going to be talking about uh, bite registrations. And so I, I thought I would share these slides with you on how we do it. So we, we do try to pick the vertical. And then I just start the bite at about 40% uh, 
to 60%, usually closer to 40 of their maximum protrusion because I know I'm going to move them more forward uh, going down the road. And now for the people who have symptoms, and the symptom that I think I most hone in on is snoring, uh, we, we do a baseline. If you can see in this right column here, the person's baseline effort was 19, and their snoring uh, on a Thornton was a 13, on a 0 to 10 scale was a 9. And if that person's chief complaint was snoring, uh, and then that would be part of our goals. We would talk to them about that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And maybe if you're a, you're a nine, I may not be able to get you down to nothing, uh, Mr. Mr. Test there. We might get you down to a three or four. How would that be? And then if they say good, then, 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 then that's our goal. So when they come in after we deliver their device and are comfortably wearing it, we're going to ask them all these same questions again. We're doing this now with a questionnaire. We have a HIPAA compliant uh, email we can send to them. They fill out this, this, this questionnaire. We put it back on the computer, and you can see this would be on their first device check on the left side. Well, their Epworth went down to an 11. Their snoring went down to a 7 and 6, respectively. And I'd say to the patient, you know, snoring's better. Are you happy? They'd probably say no. So, okay. Then we'd have them turn the device, maybe a quarter or half millimeter forward, or if it's a prosomus, we'd have them switch out uh, to, the, to the next one and maybe the, the next uh, 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 arch, depending on which ones we ordered. And they click the button there, Jeff. And then we'd call them or we'd send them that email again in three or four weeks. They don't even have to come in the office. And you can see how at a glance we can see, wow, now the Epworth went from 19 to 5. The snoring went from uh, uh, 13 to 2 and 9 to, to 1. And then we'd say to that patient, look, are you, are you happy with your symptoms? And that they would probably say yes. Now we're finished with the subject of titration. Now, if they had no subjective uh, uh, problems, we would skip this step. Or if, if I didn't feel their subjective problems were directly related to their airway. Because you could spend a lot of time trying to make people not sleepy because they may be sleepy for other reasons. So I, I hone in on the snoring and somewhat on the sleeping. If you got to make a decision on that. So then if you go to the next slide, Jeff, now here's where the, really, the, the rubber hits the road is we could even skip that step if we want it to. But the reason I think doing the subjective evaluation is important because the patients will, will be compliant and they'll be happy with their treatment if we address their subjective symptoms. And so we're two thirds of the way there to making them happy. They're wearing it, their symptoms are better. So even if the AHI, the apnea levels aren't as good as they could get with a CPAP, they're still gonna be happy with our treatment. And so now the patient's been wearing this for a while uh, and they're wearing it uh, at a comfortable position that their symptoms are better. We need a way to test them multiple nights at multiple positions. And I have a home sleep testing unit that'll do three nights. Um, we now have availability, new pulse oximeters that'll do it eight, 10 nights. We have uh, some new PAT signal uh, testing devices that will do 100 hours that I can give the patient that's disposable. I have a lot of ways in this new ring. Jeff, I am so excited about to hear about this. You just basically teased me with this in our, in our brief conversation last week. I, I'm going to be getting a lot of these for my patients, I'm fairly certain. Or we could use the circle ring that Jeff's going to talk about later, and the patient can wear their device every night. I mean, we can monitor them every night. And we're going to give them instructions to move their device uh, so many adjustments for so many nights. So we're going to, let's say they're at 50% advancement. We may go to 70, 65%, 75, 95 on the three nights. If we have six nights or we have the, the circle ring, we can, we can do this in even smaller increments. And we're going to walk them forward as far forward as they can go without having any discomfort. And we're going to gather all that data. Okay, but that's going to be a lot of data to look at, right? We're going to get all confused. Well, this is where DS3 comes in place. So if you click the button, this would be an example of someone that would do a three-night test at three different positions. And you can see, uh, for those of you who know what AHI is, I'm sure most of you do, but if you don't, that's the number of times a person has a tr uh, quitting breathing or struggles to breathe at night. So if you look at the far right column, that's about 30 times. That was their baseline. And then as we move them forward, and, and, and uh, the first column on the next to it is the column that they were wearing it comfortably and they were snoring was reduced. So you can see that's a little bit better. And then they moved at two more millimeters forward. Uh, if you see down at the bottom, it went plus one to plus three. Now they're at eight, now they're at six. And then you can also look at their SPO2 readings. I got to look at both of these and I hone in on the percentage below 90. And you can see that they went from 4.5 to three, to 2.8 to 0.5. So all, all things indicate that that far left column is a really great treatment position.
Okay, so this is why it, 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 we're, we, it doesn't matter where we start them so much because we're going to titrate them out just like you would with a CPAP in the sleep lab. And, and now with the, the ring that Jeff's gonna talk to you about, you can do that in many nights, as many nights as, as you want because uh, they can uh, using that uh, technology. Now you do have to use your brains here a little bit. Um, I, uh, I'm intending on writing software that will analyze this data and make recommendations. So that it takes a little bit of the guesswork out, but it's gonna be Guy's opinion on that because is, is that far left column best? Yeah, I think we all agree with that. But what if the column next to the far left, that SPO2 reading, I'm gonna ask this to our team of experts on here. Let's say that was an AHI of eight, but those S, that Nader was 88. And let's say that all that was the same as the left column, 0.5, percent below 90. Would you still advance them two more millimeters to gain an AHI of two? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would. I, I, would. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't. Yeah. See? So that's where it becomes cloudy. You, you gotta, <laughs> yeah. You've got the data here. You're going to have to make a decision. I don't know. I, I, I might. I might not. Depends on the patient. I would probably tend, I'd probably, tend, I'd probably tend to say no because per night variance of, is, is way greater than two for AHI regardless. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know. So you've got to marry those two together. And again, I'm going to, my ultimate goal is to write some software that, that gives recommendations on this, but, uh, you have the data. And so what's changed here? Why is this different than it was before? Because now we have the ability to inex inexpensively and easily monitor our patients on multiple nights and we can test them at multiple positions with their device. And so now finding that sweet spot at the beginning is not near as critical because we're going to walk them forward uh, and, and then make a decision. So what the patient does in this scenario is they wore it for the three nights. They turned the screw back or they went back to the prosomnus trays that they were at, at the, uh, on this 11, nine, 2015 day, cause that's where they were doing well. And then we tell them over time, I want you to walk it out there. Now, if we felt we could get away from just saying, yeah, leave it out there. Fine but usually we have them slowly move it out to that ultimate treatment position over a period of time that you'll have to determine. But this system, I think, goes a long way to helping physicians understand that we're not just making wild guesses. Yeah, we make a little bit of a wild guess where we start, but we certainly don't make a wild guess of where we end up. This doesn't involve vertical. I mean, so, you know, because the devices aren't easily changeable vertical. If I didn't get where I wanted to go here and all these weren't acceptable and you want to be a hero, uh, you can go in and add some vertical and do this whole process over again. And, you know, if it made sense, I would do that. I don't do it as much as I used to, uh, but that's where I would add, add the vertical. So uh, you can yeah, move it on there. I think that's it for those slides. Yeah. So billing. Well, first of all, any questions? Is anybody putting any questions in about that? Not yet. Okay, no questions. Okay, billing. Hey, quickly click on billing. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll link us over here to Mark. You need a system for billing, and uh, we we have that covered in DS3 through linking with other medical billers. So at a click of a button, you can do this. Don't try to do this on your own. If you don't join DS3 or use our system, I'll refer you to some other people. Uh, once you learn how to do it, do it. Certainly, you might want to do it on your own. But if you're new to this, get some help. You need a plan for this. You need you, 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 you know, it's not complicated, but it's complex. So you need a plan for it. And that's just uh, what we do at DS3. You can click the button there for a second. Yeah, we have a management system that manages this. You click the button again, because your dental softwares are built to house dental information. There's nowhere to put that information I was just showing you in dental softwares. Uh, you could, you know, you could probably practice dental sleep or, or, or dentistry with a chiropractic software but it probably wouldn't help you be efficient. Uh, and so that's why we invented DS3 is to help you be efficient at doing this. You can go on, Jeff. And uh, again, ending with looking at the four pillars if you wanna do this well, and then click again. What we do to help you, if anybody wants to know more about what we do, we help through education, coaching, software, and support. So we do have the best software, I, I really believe, but the, the, the backbone of what we do is the software, everything else, we do to help provide you with more, more help to be 360 degrees successful. Uh, if you want to, to come to one of our courses, good news is they're all done virtually now. 
And like I, Jeff, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, this COVID thing has really it's expanded these courses. We we got we get a lot more people coming to them. Uh, it's, it's you know you don't have to travel. And I and we get finished with these courses. Everybody goes, this is the best utilization of time we've ever had. We limit the courses to 30 attendees. So this is done. What we're doing right now is a Zoom webinar. We use Zoom meetings for our courses. So I'll be able to see all of you all. You'll be able to see me. You can unmute yourself and talk. So it's very much like being in a real classroom. We're doing them in the evenings. The next one is 7 to 9, August 11th, 12th, and 13th. I'll be the one teaching that. You just log in. They're uh, 495. You, if you look at that code or just email us, uh, it tells you we're on this webinar. We'll give you $100 off. I click the next slide. It also, uh, and on Friday, uh, on the 14th, 11 to 3 is all billing. It's four hours of billing done by our uh, 25 years of experience billing expert, uh, Lisa Hurt. And then you even get a kit with uh, a starter, a, 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 a provisional model, brochures, a tap, uh, a tap, uh, my tap, which we're going to talk to you about how you're going to make, so you can go make this on yourself to get started in some uh, device models. So, I mean, for what you pay, you've, you, you really uh, get that in the starter kit. So, if you want to know more about that, you click, and then the next slide is my contact or our contact. Uh, Guy, real quick, there's a question for you. Yep. Uh, when will DS3 go to full page views or notes? The uh, back that up so they can have my contact. I think that had auto advance. Yeah, good question. So that's the we have been writing, rewriting our software for two years into the latest API. One of the the you know we were one of the first cloud based softwares out there, uh, especially for for with only first one for dental sleep medicine, but even in the dental field altogether, we started DS3 over 10 years ago and it was very new then. And we, it was, we made the right decision, but the timing wasn't perfect because all of our codes, a hundred percent handwritten code. There was no such thing as what's called an API now. So I don't know if anybody knows what an API is, but an API now, if you decide to go design your own software, it's chunks of code that are already written. So if I want to have uh, you know, a, a, a desk, I can buy, you know, here's an API that I plug in and wow, there's a pretty desk. Uh, and so we have had taken two years to rewrite all of our software in the latest API so that we can make a lot more dynamic changes. Last night, we released one of the biggest releases we ever have. Uh, the new patient portals all in the new API, our, all of our accounting software ledger changes are in that. So this, the answer to the question is when we get it all in the new API, uh, that will change. It will, it'll be a dynamic screen then, and the it will be finished by the end of this year's our timeline uh, on the two-year project. So I think that answered the question. Now, hopefully, in the next six months, uh, we have not slowed down even during this time on the uh, rewriting of, of of all that code. And it's a commitment to us to have a, a long-term good software because no one sees it. It's like a car; you'll see the outside of it. And we've spent really millions of dollars re retooling underneath the hood. To make it better for everyone, so uh, hey Jeff, there's the a, next, go ahead. Yeah, there's how you get hold of info, would, and you can get hold. Of, would, go go ahead. Ahead. I would say you can get a hold of me at just gy at Dental Sleep Solutions if you want info. Just my first name's Guy <laughs> with no U in it. My I'm from Kentucky. My parents couldn't spell. Uh, I can't either, by the way. So if I send you an email, I will sure not spell something right. So it's gy uh, at dentalsleepsolutions.com. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. It's all yours, brother. Jeff, would you give me uh, control of the screen? Uh, uh, go ahead on the click um, on the top view and then request remote control. I actually would like, um, if you just give me ability to share my screen, that'd be easier, I think. More control, that's good. Uh -huh. That way I can, because uh, we're gonna need to make up some time looking at the uh, yeah. 15. Okay, let me, let me pull you up here more. Uh, I'm going to make more host. Is that fair? Because in the seven minutes that uh, Guy has left me. <laughs> now, I think you got 45, don't you? No, we got one more presenter after me. Oh, that's right. Uh, and sorry. so uh, I had I had uh, a little bit of time. I apologize. All right. That's all right. I'm just being, hey, if I didn't love you, I couldn't tease you, right? <laughs> so here we go. Um, so uh, thanks, Guy. That was that was incredible. You know, and, and one of the things uh, the guy said uh, kind of jumps out for me is he talked about, and, and I agree, it's really about um, the follow-up and it's really about the finishing position. But Guy did say, 
it doesn't matter where we start. And I'm going to argue a little differently, and, and Guy knows what I'm going to say here, because the closer I start to the finish position, the fewer appointments the patient will have, the faster time we'll get them into treatment, the more efficient we'll be at what we do, and, and our physicians are going to be happier and stuff like that. So I'm going to take a very different perspective, because we're going to talk about evidence-based device selection. And let me tell you what that means. That means, first off, we're going to talk about science over opinion. We're going to talk about what science tells us about the devices that are out there. Some of these devices we're using today were very similar to the devices that I made 30 years ago teaching with Keith Thornton out at the Pankey Institute. The, the original TAP device didn't have the adjustment. It wasn't titratable, but it was very similar to some of the devices that are out there today. And, and he's had some great evolutions, done some super things with the TAP appliance, for example. And Keith Thornton is the T Thornton in the Thornton anterior positioner. Uh, he's been an incredible pioneer. But the devices we have today are very different and being made very differently with a great deal more precision. So we're going to talk about science over opinion. We're going to talk about science over price. Because sometimes the device might be $50 or $100 more, but if it saves you 30 minutes of chair time at $600 an hour, you come out way ahead. So just like Guy and, and Suzanne were talking about, you know, Kettenbox is an incredible material. I've used it for years and years and years. But people who do a lot of anything like this find a more efficient, as long as it's accurate and precise system, and they move to scanning. And that's going to happen. And, and Kettenbox certainly knows that. The second thing we're going to think about when we talk about choosing the right kind of devices is we're going to talk about differences rather than similarities. See, just like even in the bite, you know, it was great because Suzanne, you were talking about the differences of doing vertical first and then looking at some of the horizontal components. So that's a great way to look at one of the nuances of looking at bite relationships. Well, when we, when we start to talk about devices, all devices reposition the mandible anteriorly. Pretty much all devices have some adjustable component. There's a couple of exceptions, but we won't even mention those. So all devices are adjustable or titratable in different increments and, and have different ways of doing that. So rather than talk about all of those similarities, we're going to talk about some of the differences that might drive us to choose one device or a type of device over another. And sometimes that'll be, you know, maybe somebody's only got anterior teeth and it makes more sense to grab onto the anteriors or somebody only has posterior teeth. Or maybe it'd be somebody has, is claustrophobic and they need an airway opening or somebody has closed nasally and so they need an oventus o2 second nose there are some rare instances or allergies that'll drive us into a select group but for the most part it's going to be about the differences and what they provide the third thing and this is the one i really want you to keep in mind when we're talking about device selection is device selection should be driven first by the patient's needs first by the patient needs not ours the patient needs we come second but we also should be thinking of a third party in this relationship and that's the position because if I make devices that look like crap in six months and smell and are very badly stained and the patient's had a bad experience and their cheek is getting irritated or they're delaminating or things like that, if they've had a bad experience with side effects, those physicians are never going to trust us and send us more referrals. So it's critical that we think about all the parties, all the stakeholders in this equation when we think about choosing devices. So I'm going to go very quickly in the sake of time, but you're going to have access to this video to view again and again. Um, I'll, I'll make these slides that I've got here available to you if you want them separately. I'm happy to do that. And uh, so you'll be able to reach out to me. You've got my email there, mmurphy at personas.com. So if you've got a chance to jot that down, go right ahead. And that'll give you something to grab onto. We'll talk about the basic evolution of the, the products and devices that we see today and then how we match them to patients. And then we'll talk about why I think precision matters. And it's about all those things, science over opinion. It's about the differences and the advantages that that precision gives you. And then how we earn the trust of physicians. Um, we started off with tongue retaining devices and, and, and as crazy as I think those things are, a big suction cup with a ring around it, there still might be a viable opportunity there for a denture patient. So I don't really throw them out. There's still an opportunity to use a crazy device like that. And then we looked at an evolution of devices where they were not adjustable, non-adjustable devices, kind of monoblocks upper and lower. And um, I remember making some of those in the beginning. And if it was a patient that was very uncomfortable there, we had to remake the device. Very cumbersome. So the evolution towards adjustable devices was a big positive advancement. Whether it was a jack screw or a dorsal screw or a tap hook in the front, fantastic advances in the evolution of devices. And then different materials. You know, for the most part, we're still looking today at polymethylmethacrylate, either handmade or milled. And milled has tremendous advantages. In fact, I would argue milled has left all the other devices in the dust. And then we have printed materials. And the printed nylons are also incredible. They're very comfortable, they're very thin, they're very nice. They're also a little bit more porous and they're so flexible that we do see some tooth movement. So when we start to think about different materials, advantages, disadvantages, benefits, we have to take all that into consideration. 
So when we look at the different materials that are out there and the different ways that the devices are made, if you take the mastery course or a qualified course to be ADSM, they won't talk about any of the names of devices. They won't say a herp. They won't say a prosomnus. They won't say somnimate. They won't say um, uh, panthera. They won't say any of the names of any of the manufacturers. They will talk about it's a printed nylon strap device or it's a fulcrum strap device or it's a, a block dorsal interlocking device or it's a uh, interlocking dorsal with a screw advancement device. They'll use these kind of terminologies. So if you see some of that in the literature, um, I'll use names and stuff today, but basically some devices push, some devices pull, some pull bilaterally from the sides. And so you want to make sure both of those anchoring mechanisms and both of those propulsion methods are going forward. Some pull from the front, like a tap would. Some have a strap. And as you extend or shorten the strap, because it's the shortening the strap on a pull, Lengthening the strap on a push sort of device moves the mandible further forward. Some even have innovative things like you see this green one here on the screen. Uh, that's one of the types of an Oasis device that has a little paddle that does some of the same things that the mutes that Suzanne was talking about were doing, trying to open the caudal valve. And if we can, when you breathe through your nose and then you pull your caudal valve and open that up, these are simulating that kind of a movement. So there's a lot of ways that we've seen this evolution from these crude um, tongue sucking devices to hold the tongue forward to static non-adjustable through the adjustables and now we're starting to see some precision manufacturing precision design and precision engineering in the devices we're seeing and, and you see that because as soon as some of those newer ones came out and i do work for prosomnus so you're going to hear good things about prosomnus so i i don't just use prosomnus i mean guy knows me he knows the kind of different devices i use but i do use predominantly prosomnus devices because in their family of choices they allow me a great latitude in what i can provide my patients but if i have a patient that's allergic to acrylic I've got to look at some other material and nylon pops right up for me. Or if I have a patient that has a lot of anterior veneers and they're freaking out about having some hard material over those, I go to something that's going to be more flexible or something that's going to be softer. We've got to look at those different options. So there are different times to use different types of devices, but it's really hard to leave the precision arena that we're starting to see today. And some of the other manufacturers now are starting to mill their devices. You've seen that from Dynaflex, from Somnimed. Now, Somnimed unfortunately knows the platform and then hollows out and puts a soft liner in it, but still you can see the strength of that outer material is going to be far better. So we're seeing an evolution, and in a few years, my guessing is this whole big family, the 100 and 110 or so handmade artisanal devices that we see are going to go away because they lack the precision that we need to earn the um, trust of physicians. So I would offer a new classification, kind of jokingly, these are all devices that were made for my mouth. Every one of these devices you see in that picture fit my mouth. And you can see the temporary devices. You've got a MyTap there and a Blue Pro and a Apnea Guard. And then a variety of different custom adjustable devices we've got. And then the precision family devices. Those all happen to be Prosomnus devices. There's an IA, a CALP, and a Precision Herbs to pH. But you can see there are differences, distinct differences for, for sure in terms of size and volume, and not just in terms of precision of those different devices. And we're seeing an evolution from handmade, artisanal, crude, dentist design devices to now, you know, these are designed by people that used to be with 3M and they're looking at it from an engineering perspective and from a CAD CAM perspective and a medical grade qualification perspective uh, of a medical device than they are from just uh, holding a mandible forward. We would all agree that there's a list, just like we would have had in dental school, of ideal characteristics of an oral appliance. And there's never going to be, probably in our lifetime, one device, one material that checks off every single box. Are we getting closer? Yes, that's this whole evolution of materials. When Prosomnus moved from cold cure, artisanal, handmade, um, and even though they put it in a pressure pot, acrylic materials to the, to the milled PMMA, that control cure material, it was stronger, they could make it smaller, they could have less inner arch space, they could make it lingual so there was more room for the tongue so you didn't have to advance the patient as far. Tremendous advantages because Prosomnus was smarter than somebody else? Well. Maybe in one way they were because they were able to find a material that was better than most of the materials that we were using yesterday. Now, it's still a polymethyl methacrylate. And so when we look at some of the things that are more flexible and very forgiving, like a nylon that you see in the Panthera, that's a kind of an exciting material too. So as we look at some of these new flexible materials, we might find some interesting kind of a material that's going to come along for us that's going to really evolutionize what we're doing today in dentistry and how we're doing dental sleep medicine. Because if we could have the same precision CAD CAM characteristics we have that we're doing today in a milled PMMA that have some degree of flexibility 
that would be kind of an exciting evolution for us indeed. But it really starts, I said, with the patient. And so we have to be thinking about, and this is a chart that was taken on a Razor Redmond's article that was in Dallas of Practice uh, uh, last year, I think. And it's, we really have to look at the patient characteristics. What are the attributes of the patient? What's their phenotype? What's their arch size, their arch form, the number of teeth, position, periodontal health, a claustrophobia risk? Are they a bruxer? How's their nasal breathing, crowding? Do they have an anterior? Opening? You could go on and on down the list. There's a number of different attributes, phenotypes that the patient expresses that should help drive our appliance selection. We should start with saying whatever we consider to be the very best type or styles of appliance, and I'm going to have a very biased opinion, and I'll apologize for that. But I'm going to I'm going to try and start with that best device, and then if they can't wear that best device because their patient attributes don't match that, then I'll start to compromise in a matrix format as to what do I need to do. And, and a good example is what I mentioned about uh, I've had a couple of acrylic uh, allergy patients. I've had a couple of patients with veneers and concerns about hard acrylics on their teeth. And so you start to put together this matrix in your mind. Oh, sometimes the matrix is they're over 65. And that's going to limit our device selection right there because of some ridiculous, archaic way that PDAC decides which devices we can use. Hopefully, Guy, I loved your point about how the, uh, the COVID-19 and the administration has loosened up so much about how we're able to do telemedicine. That's the only kind of consults I think I've done since the middle of March, and I don't plan on changing that right now. It's really streamlined my one-day-a-week practice um, and, and to be an even more productive and very flexible. But I think we might see some changes in the PDEC guidelines, and that's going to be pretty exciting, too, because they're still archaic and well behind the times. So here's the types of devices you see most out there in the playground when you're looking at things. Uh, the single most prescribed device as a style of devices is the Herbs device. And once you see that tube with a tube inside it and a screw, which has a pinhole that you turn or it has a little nut that you turn on, it doesn't matter. That type of device, bilateral, usually push in nature, is going to give us a pretty good mandibular advancement. Now, when would you and when wouldn't you use that? Well, you would or wouldn't use that as long as you had good, solid posterior dentition, you had adequate retention because these patients are going to be, these two arches are going to be held together. So you've got to have the adequate amount of teeth so that, and structure of teeth and shape of the teeth that you can be retentive enough that when we use the elastics we're talking about to hold those two arches together, this patient's gonna still be comfortable and be able to put those arches in. You can see in some of those devices, you can see ball clasp for retention. That always ticks me off when we have more precision ways of retaining devices, because when I see ball clasp, I figure that's the only place it's retentive. And if it really fit well, it wouldn't need to have ball clasps at all. Now, similarly, being a bilateral propulsion uh, mechanism, we've got the dorsal types of devices, and there's many of those. And even the Prasamus IA, you could consider a dorsal kind of device, but it lacks that um, jack screw kind of mechanism on the side. Instead, it's iterative in the way that it advances the mandible, so I've kept it out of this classification. But it does have a dorsal matching post. It's just on a little different angle. It's not the 70 degrees you see here. But these are nice in terms of a little difference from the herps in terms of it's still pushing the mandible forward. I'm good with that. Um, but it's doing so against this acrylic post. And so you've got to have teeth on there that can maintain that, retentive enough, hold that in for sure. But now I don't have to worry about the retention being quite as crazy because this patient doesn't have the upper and lower large held together. The anterior hooking and con containment of the tap device in terms of its propulsion pulling forward on the mandible means that's really something I've got to think about. What's the condition of those anterior teeth? Are they able and willing to support that from a comfort standpoint? We'll have some patients in dorsal or herps devices that will complain of a little bit of tenderness or soreness in their posterior teeth in the morning when they get up, as long as it's transient or fine, and patients with the tap device that will have discomfort in their anterior teeth. So you've got to watch for those kinds of prerequisites when you're looking at those phenotypes. Less commonly, we'll see some of the flexible design devices. Uh, I guess the, the ResMed, the, the Narval is still being made in, in some foreign countries, but we don't see it here in the U.S. anymore, but we do see the Panthera. This is actually an old Narval. The Panthera's got a strap design on it. And it's a, it's a great device. I mean, it's very small, it's flexible, it's actually very precise. It, uh, it comes close to the guidelines that the AADSM has for whatever starting position bite relationship Suzanne, you or Guy or I take, we're supposed to be able to deliver a device that's within one millimeter of that starting position, and this one comes close. It's just a little bit over a millimeter off on average three-dimensionally. Some of the other devices are up, and I'll show you some of the data, up to five or six millimeters from the original starting position. And Guy, to your point, that's gonna be more appointments from an adjustment standpoint treatment. 
Uh, but these devices are nice. Uh, you can have them cover the front teeth or not. And if it's just a strap, you're going to be a little bit more at risk for tooth movement. The studies have shown that. Uh, that's a, a challenge with this. But the real challenge with this device, even though I do kind of like it, is they do gunk up. It's a very porous device. I'll show you scanning electron micrographs that you need to consider when you're choosing devices that will allow this one to really take on some burden and some biomass as we go through. Um, down in the bottom, I apologize, I've got a picture of an old Aventus. Uh, I, I've got to stick a photograph in of an Aventus O2 Vent, the new one that is uh, PDAC approved and is a strap device. It's uh, an interesting looking contraption, but if you had a patient that couldn't breathe through their nose at all, wasn't going to have surgery, et cetera, and you wanted them to have a tube sticking out literally like a squished um, toilet paper wrapper to suck air in through, that would be the device for you. And to that end, that device works very well at doing that. Now, Suzanne made the point, couldn't agree more. We really want to develop nasal breathers in our patients. It's healthier for them for a variety of good reasons that are beyond the scope of talking about device design. But uh, this device actually works counter to that. The EMA strap is an okay, inexpensive device when we're thinking about devices. If it's made off a fantastic milled platform, none of them are. If you took a milled prosomnus platform and we made one with nubs on the side that the straps would hook onto, then I think, well, there's a good device where the teeth aren't going to move, it's going to fit well, it's going to be very retentive, and then the EMA straps would become functional and you'd have a design there that I could probably get behind a little bit. But when somebody makes one of these out of a 060 suck down material or something like that, it's really a temporary device being used uh, like a snore hook or something to fulfill some sort of a legal requirement and save somebody money. And, and I really would struggle to get behind that because again, when a, when a patient goes back to their physician, and I'll show you the data, 91% of the physicians see the patient after they've been in treatment successfully. They see them for a follow-up visit and they see these devices, they smell these devices, they see what the patient is encountering and, and what kind of an experience they're having, and that does not bode well for us. It's no wonder that physicians are still very hesitant in, in large part, and they're only writing about 5% of their mild and moderate prescriptions for oral appliances. Uh, uh, Prosomnus has cheated a little bit. Uh, they have the number one device prescribed in North America. It's not the number one style. That's Herbst. Herbst is, there's more Herbst than anything else. But in individual prescription basis, there's more IAs prescribed in North America than any other specific device. It is very innovative because of the uh, posts that are vertical like that. We'll talk about why they're vertical in a second and what the advantages are of that from the standpoint. Then you've got in the middle there a CALP which is a very low profile continuous advancement device, a dorsal, if you will, a traditional looking dorsal, but very non-traditional in terms of how it's made. And then what we call a precision herps. And you can see how low those arms are on the precision herps so that it gets a very uh, horizontal propulsion um, of that mandible going forward and little attributes like the comfort bumps to keep the screw area comfortable and everything like that. Um, the, the kinds of things that Prasonis is able to do that I think has really catapulted device selection into an entirely new category is quite honestly milling out of this controlled cured PMMA. Once they did that, they were able to do things, create stronger devices that uh, don't have a tendency to break, um, have a level of precision that you can't achieve making them by hand, and have a higher level of comfort and more tongue space. And so we're going to start to see, I believe, in the next years or two years, more and more manufacturers, as we have already, start to go towards milled platforms, milled designs. You've, you've seen it from some of the manufacturers already. It just makes sense, and we're going to see fewer and fewer of these handmade devices because uh, they just don't have the level of precision we'd like to see, and they certainly don't uh, earn the trust of physicians like we'd like. Now, the interesting thing about the prosomnus is you trade the trays out, and, and Guy was alluding to that earlier, to, to advance the mandible. So you start in this whatever position we've all agreed on to start the patient in, and that upper zero, lower zero, and if you want to go a half millimeter or one millimeter forward, you trade out one of the trays, and we have another tray with the same post position the lower or upper tray has been advanced a half or one or two millimeters, whatever the options are that a person has chosen. You can still order some of the phenotypic examples for somebody who needs a, a bruxure, who needs an anterior discluder, or a mouth breather, who needs an open airway in the front, or elastic hooks that can be milled in that are a little bit more comfortable, and a ball class sticking out. So there's a lot of very specific characteristics. But this vertical angulation of the post was very important because otherwise when the mandible hangs open, the mandible retrudes. The moment you hang open your mandible, if you hang it open and it's allowed to fall back along that 70 degree angle, the mandible retreats. So if you do have a person who's snoring or mouth breathing when they're relaxed a little bit at night, if they open their mouth, then de facto we would have to protrude that patient further to get them into a therapeutic position if their mouth hangs open sometimes at night. 
So the engineers who developed this from Prasomnus had it at this perfect 90 degree angle, which is really, really innovative. And you'll see that same feature in the other types of devices as best you can. And you can see the math here on how much the mandible retrudes at various vertical openings at different degree angulations. Um, you know, the milled solutions are able to be made and all the milled solutions are able to be made stronger, less volume, more tongue space. That's gonna result in uh, you know, less protrusion to be able to get people into therapy. They're smaller devices, and they're not just smaller when I measure them in thickness and height and everything like that. This is a recent abstract in the Journal of Dental Sleep Medicine by Jerry Hu, measuring Prasomnus against a few other devices and looking at the volumetric change in size. So the overall size, this was done in Archimedes test where you dunk them in water and measure the volumetric change. There's a dramatic difference in volume. Even when you look on the, on the left-hand side of some of those other devices, all made for the same mouth, by the way, this one up here on the upper left, only covers the first molars and barely a small sliver of the second molar. So it looks much shorter from AP position. It's actually still larger in overall volume than the Prasomnus IA, but it looks smaller because it doesn't cover the second molars, where here we've got a wrapping of the second molars. You can see this Somnometavant up here too only covers the first part of the second molars, and it's still much larger in volume because of the milled space for the soft liner, et cetera. So I'm gonna keep going nice and quickly. Um, if we want to select devices for our patients that are going to earn the trust for physicians, we have an opportunity to change their prescribing patterns. This is what's important. Right, right now today, there's less than $200 million in lab fees paid for oral appliance therapy and a little over $4.5 billion for CPAP therapy. If we could affect a 10% shift in prescribing patterns for physicians, we would more than triple the market for oral appliance therapy. So when we start to make decisions about which devices for which patient, it's not just about comfort and cost, what's easy for me to do or easy for me to see, it's about what is going to help earn the type of developing relationship that we need with physicians. And physicians, 91% of them see the patient after the visit, they're concerned about does the device work? Is the patient comfortable? They're concerned about insurance coverage because they're not completely clear that a dentist can do medical stuff and what are the side effects. So we have to be using devices that have the highest level of efficacy, certainly have uh, very high levels of comfort and fit for the patient and have mitigating factors in terms of side effects. So we want to be able to make them smaller and precision means we can make them smaller, more comfortable, less TMD, less advancement. This is a chart showing you can see here's the Prasomnus device. This is an IA. Uh, within one millimeter of the starting position as recorded. Here's uh, uh, the nylon strap device we were talking about, that's a Panthera. And then other devices and their variation from the original starting position as measured uh, in, in three different samples on the same patient. So there's a phenomenal variation when you make them by hand or you reline with a soft liner in terms of getting that device delivered to you, doctor, in the same starting position that you prescribed. When you have that precision, it means fewer appointments. Now, to today, Guy, I totally agree with you. I try not to advance those devices. I try to have the patient advance those devices and then have them pulse ox or, or do a follow-up titration study uh, so that I don't have to intervene. So I guess less device, less appointments, maybe less hassle for the patient tomorrow and, and less hassle for me in terms of following up with that, recording all that data. Um, I'd like to get them to that finished position as fast as I can. We've had no tooth movement with the kind of milled precision platforms. Uh, there, all the studies have shown tooth movement with handmade cold cure acrylic and more tooth movement with the nylon flexible devices. But we've actually got a two-year study here. Now we're coming up on three-year study, uh, which was done at the University of Pacific showing no tooth movement at all. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, I, I wish I could tell you that I thought this looked fantastic, but it sure looks better than hard acrylic, soft liner material, and certainly something that uh, is very porous, this nylon material. But this is why these different materials take up different amounts of stain, they discolor, and we have so many problems with them. Forget about the delamination. This is just the staining and discoloration that is taken up by these different devices. When we have this control cured PMMA, it's just so dense, it's a much safer material to use. Precision means better outcomes, no question about that. And Prasomnus has, uh, when you look at reverse meta analysis of the data of all the different studies, in the orcades as well as uh, recent uh, AADSM papers on oral appliance efficacy trends. Prasomnus leads the, uh, the pack right there with anterior hinge style tap type devices not far behind. The good news is if you look from back to 1995, we've been getting better at all that stuff every single day. You've got my email address there. Um, I hope I gave you a little different perspective on thinking about um, how we would begin to choose what kind of an oral
clients we want to use, not just based on patient phenotype or uh, some of those kinds of things like that, but thinking about how does this impact my relationship with my physicians? Um, how does this really um, allow me to use the attributes that are different and albeit better in some of the newer devices that are out there that we know, some of the precision, because we're going to see better results. Nobody would want their knee replacement done with an open surgery and an old style device that's in there now. Everybody wants the latest and the greatest. I don't want a stent that was used 10 or 15 or 20 years ago in the heart. I want the most current one. Uh, nobody wants to buy, go into a new car dealership and get a car that has the same features that are five or 10 or 15 years old. And that's kind of what we're doing with medical devices that were designed a long time ago and lack some of those attributes. So that's my case, Jeff. I hope that answers the question of how do we approach uh, device selection from an evidence basis. Thank, um, thank you, Mark. I, I appreciate that. That's uh, That was a great presentation. And it, it's interesting. I hadn't seen that. And um, my presentation is going to pick up where yours, where yours left off in, in a very important section. And let right. me that up. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my presentation. But before I do, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a poll, okay? Because I want to make sure I get this in. And it's really important that um, I'm asking some very, very important questions, okay? And so while I'm talking, I'd like, in, you know, I would invite uh, all the attendees and even, you know, and even the panelists if you want, is to take a look at, I'm only asking 10 questions, but they're really important. And just take a moment and, and start um, answering those questions. You know, are you currently using a digital scanner? Um, and and what, what I'm very curious to find out is, I, we, we wanna get a sense of where the market's going. And so if you guys can, you know, if you attendees wouldn't mind and just take a moment and start filling these polls out, uh, I'd much appreciate it. And, um, and then what, while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and, and start talking a little bit about um, what I, I have uh, plenty of time is, is my nature is, well, first I want to say um, Dr. Miracle and I are writing an article and it's interesting that, what Mark talked about. The article that we're putting together has to do with how COVID-19 is changing sleep disorders in general. And one of the profound changes, COVID-19 is affecting sleep labs in sleep, medical sleep medicine much, much more than it's affecting dentistry. And let me explain to you how that is. The idea of the titration study, you know the word titration? Um, that is ancient, that the titration, COVID-19 has probably killed the titration sleep study. And the reason is, is because of COVID-19, there's a process by which you need to clean a, a titrating unit. And sleep labs aren't doing it. So actually, if you look at this computer right here, that's a sleep study that I'm scoring for, you know, that I, my side gig. And we, we did 98% of our sleep studies were split night, where we diagnosed for two or three hours and then put them on CPAP. Since March, we were closed for a few months. We've done zero. Actually, we've done one, and it was, a, <laughs> and it was an appliance study. So the, I, the, the concept of titration is, is gone away, and I don't know if it's dead or sleeping, but it, it, it's, it's, you have to understand that is a huge shift. And the reason that it's important is there is a, a, a profound difference between when you say titration to a physician and when you say titration to a dentist. They're completely different. The, the titration to a physician is a short-term event. It is a technician that turns a knob until the airway pops open. And that titration is completed, done that night, and the titration is no more. Okay, it's a short-term, easy event. And even that's gone away because the um, all, I would say greater than 90% of the CPAP units that are delivered today are auto titrating. And that's why we don't really need titration studies. And we haven't needed them for several years, but because of COVID-19, it's kind of forced the issue. And so what, it, what, what does that mean? Well, what that means is, that's creating an opportunity. 
okay? And I want to talk about how we can create that up or, or exploit that opportunity and get a little more of that $4.5 billion that Mark talked about. Um, and, and especially when you look at the concept of oral appliance therapy versus CPAP therapy, it's still, if you just introduce the two, people would, would prefer oral appliance therapy. So it's, 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 a, it's another opportunity. And here, here's where I'm talking about the circle. And I'm taking a long time to, to explain this, but this is why this is important to me. So the titration process to a dentist, you have to understand what a physician is expecting. The physician is expecting some type of information that says the patient used it each night for so many nights for 90 days, and they get reports on that. That's what they're used to. In dentistry, we really don't have an equivalent, okay? So we have oximeters, you know, like what, what, what Guy was talking about that are for a few nights that are great, maybe 10 nights. Um, but what physicians are looking for are... are efficaciousness how efficacious is does it work is the patient sleeping better and so there's a technical advancement that has recently been developed that I think fills a niche that dentistry needs to be more competitive with CPAPs and and I and that's what I want to talk about okay and and so it has to it's called it's it's a wearable so I'm going to be talking about remote patient monitoring facilitated by a wearable Wearables have been around for a while. Uh, they collect some channels that we need, some do, some don't, but now there's wearables available that collect very specific data that perfectly fills this niche that I'm, that I'm talking about, whereby an oral appliance can be equivalent to CPAP with regards to the titration process and demonstrating efficacy, okay? So this is why you would wanna get involved with what I'm about to talk about, one. We track therapy progress, you know, SPO2, we all know about that. But we also, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? The reason that we're doing it is we want to improve human sleep, okay? We're not doing it for any other reason. At the end of the day, we want to improve their sleep. So the circle tracks sleep quality. So you get a, a four-stage histogram, okay? And that's been around for a while. You know, there's been devices that offer that. And, and that in of itself is not the... The engaging feature in my in my mind the engaging feature is that you can wear this thing every night for a month for two months it's it's this here let me show it to you i'm sure a lot of you are thinking wow that's an attractive piece of jewelry jeff i didn't know you sold jewelry but this is what i'm talking about and and this is this is the this is what this is the sensor so we'll talk about a little bit more about that okay number two it engages your patient Okay, so this is where we were actually be able to do better than CPAP. And here's what I mean by that. When you have a patient that is wearing the circle and they, their, their sleep report shows up on their phone, they hit a button and it goes to you and it says, oh, you did this or that and, and their sleep quality is there and their histograms there. They're now wanting to achieve improvement on that graph, just like what you saw in Mark's uh, uh, software. You see, you see those improvements. Now the, the patient's on the same level of wanting to do better that the dentist is, okay? So this incentivizes all kinds of good things. And, and so that, that's another reason. And the third reason is you can get paid, okay? Now, it, this is a new thing. The, the remote patient monitoring is relatively new and especially for dentists, but Guy brought this up earlier uh, when he called sleep apnea a chronic condition. So remote patient monitoring is a or, or sleep apnea is a chronic condition. Therefore, it's covered by remote patient monitoring. Okay, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. So the circle, it's attractive. I've already bragged about that. It it it's an app that goes on your phone. And on this little thing, I can't I can't get over this. On this little device here, there's a Bluetooth transmitter, a battery, memory, an oximeter and heart rate variability assessment and all that. So I've, I've talked, this is now the third time that I've talked about this and, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling guys. So if you're, you know, um, so the, um, the thing that I, I wanna discourage is people saying, well, is it as good as a watch pad? Okay, 
we're not talk. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about an HST. I'm talking about measuring a patient every night over a long period of time. That's my objective. No, it's not as good as a watch pad. In fact, it's probably 95% as good as most of the oximeters out there. But would you wear an oximeter for 60 days? No, you wear this though. I mean, it, 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 that's the main feature. It is a good oximeter, don't get me wrong. But the thing to ask yourself, if you really understand what I'm talking about, is can we collect this data over a period of time? Because when you do, you know exactly how the patient's doing. And let me explain how that, that goes. It's a rechargeable device. You know, there's a report on your phone. You click a button and then it, the, the report goes to the dentist. There's even a way that a dentist can get the data automatically. Um, here's, here's a report. So this is what gets generated in the morning. The, the device has three modes. It has a sleep mode, a daytime mode, and an, and an exercise mode. And, and this, is, this is the sleep mode. And the sleep mode is, a, there's an oximeter there. Um, and you can see it gives you the basic information. You get an ODI, you get the average, you get the minimum, and then you get the amount of time that you get at various levels. And you say, well, that's really, under, you know, just about any oximeter would deliver that. And you're right, but would you wear every oximeter, any oximeter for 30 straight nights without, and not, and not be bothered by it? Um, there's a heart rate study there. Um, and then really interesting to me is that sleep histogram. So that sleep histogram is gonna give you wake, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM. Okay, so that report that you're looking at, that's unconsolidated sleep. Okay, so you can see there's all kinds of sleep. Yeah, so this is, this is not a, a great uh, sleep report with regards to sleep quality. So now we're gonna zoom out, we're gonna look at seven nights of data. Okay, and then now this is where it becomes interesting. So there's my there's a baseline. This is me uh, being horrible on CPAP. Okay, so but here here's where it's really cool. Um, look at night one. I started the night really good. Let me see if I got this. So if you look at right here, that's an awesome report. And I woke up. I took my CPAP off, and I finished the night without my CPAP. And that's what this is. Okay. So, and you, you would get this report, all right? So night two, I did pretty good. You can see night two, I did all right. Night three, not so much. I didn't even bother with CPAP night three, okay? Night four, I said, oh, I better wear my CPAP. Night five, same thing. Night six, I'd started without CPAP, woke up and said, wow, I feel like I just got hit by a truck and put my CPAP on. And look how I finished the night there, okay? And then night seven, and I, I did well because I made it through the night with CPAP. So transpose this to the first seven nights you wear your sleep appliance, okay? So the, the challenge is, if you ask your patient, how'd you do the last two weeks? Is, that, is their reply granular enough to be useful? Or even if you say, how'd you do the last three or four days? And they'll say, oh yeah, I feel better, because oftentimes people do feel better. Because if you go from an AHI of 40 to an AHI of 10, three nights later, you're gonna say, wow, I feel so much better, I can't believe it. And, but are you, are you really, are you done? Are you, are you there? And, and I would say maybe, but maybe not. So the, the thing to do is can we get more granular with this data and why would you wanna be more granular? Well, in those early phases, this is the, the make or break point in, of time. And, you know, I haven't talked a lot about the histogram, but if you look at the histogram, you can see consolidation on, you know, sleep consolidation on nights that I slept well. And you see fragmentation on nights that I didn't. This is where people are going to say, oh yeah, I want to do better, you know. And we have patients calling their dentist saying, hey, listen, I, my, can I, can we do something? My sleep isn't that great. And so this is the type of interaction that I think can improve the titration process. But moreover, it's better than CPAP because the, those compliance reports that the CPAP devices give you, they, the, the patient doesn't see those. They don't know what's going on. There, there's no incentive for the patient to looking at a report to do better because it, it's just not there. 
So again, on this slide, um, okay, on this slide we have, um, you know, this is the uh, addressing issues early. I think we could all agree that, that that's the case. Um, you can use the circle as an oximeter. So if you're already going to get an oximeter and you want to use it for various types of screening activity that you already are doing, by all means use it. The, the cost uh, per device, you know, I think you might be surprised at how low it is. Um, a lot of people, um, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but again, if you're using oximetry for a variety of uh, activities in your, in your workflow anyway, it's an oximeter, okay? Uh, and then obviously for the titration part uh, that I've been talking about for the past few minutes. So there's a couple business models how this works. So the, the retail price is, is just under $300. And as a dentist, you can purchase a fleet of this, not unlike you would purchase some oximeters, and you would dispense them in the same way. Uh, and, and that's certainly a model that is proven, and that is a model that um, the, the clinical benefit to oximetry outweighs the cost. So mo most dentists would, would be willing to absorb the cost of an oximeter because it outweighs the benefits of, you know, the, the benefits outweigh that. Now, Here's where it gets interesting, okay? What if I could tell you, you could bill for this activity? So not only do we have all the clinical benefits that I've talked about, what if we could add on that that this is profitable? And it's not just profitable like replacing, like telemedicine is profitable because it increases efficiencies, but we're taking one, one activity and replacing it with another activity and we're creating efficiencies and all kinds of benefits that are awesome. But what if we could add a, a, a revenue stream, okay? And in doing so, we greatly, we greatly enhance the titration process and the clinical outcome. So this is, this is the second part. So I could end the story with the clinical part, but there's more to it than that. So, so let me just spend a minute or two on how that works. Remote patient monitoring is a reimbursable activity. And again, like I mentioned earlier, Guy talked about it, it's a chronic condition and it's, got, it's a covered code. And, and oral appliance therapy is an accepted therapeutic intervention to treat sleep apnea, okay? There's a portal available, okay? So if you're a, if you're a busy practice, like you're a um, guy who's doing, I don't know, 20, 30, 50, I don't, you know, he's a very busy person. And he's doing, he's tracking 30 people, 40 people at a time. Um, there is a portal available that can track all this, and it's really inexpensive, but it's, it's a layer of work. If you're doing two or three patients a month, just send out the, the, the unit and have the patient email it to you and send, you know, get, the, get, the, get the data back. But know that if you want to get active in billing, the portal is when, when, that's when I would recommend that you get active. So who can bill for remote patient monitoring? A physician or other qualified healthcare professional. Okay, so as a dentist, are you a qualified healthcare professional? I've asked several billers this, and the answer is yes. Okay, but we really don't care about Jeff's opinion on this. And we, to be honest, we don't care about Mark's or Suzanne's. We care about the billing company. Okay, so at the end of the day, when somebody's about to write a check, what do they think? And, and that's, the, that's the major question, and that's what we're exploring now. Um, here are the codes and here's the dollars associated with remote patient monitoring. And I'll just kind of run through this really quick. And again, like Mark said, the presentation that I'm sharing with you now will be sent to you um, as part of a follow-up thank you email for, for, for registering. Um, so issuing the device, you get $20 for that because you have to show the person how to use it. Um, then there's the renting of the device. So you're taking your asset, put it in at somebody's home, and if it's in their home and they wear it for 16 days, that's considered remote patient monitoring. Um, so that's another code, and that's the code there. Uh, the third item there, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the third item is you looking at data and making a decision, okay? And then the fourth code is, and there's two codes there, those are appointments. So you've made a decision and you're gonna call your patient and say, listen, We've been looking at your data for a month. You just made 58.38. And then you're talking to your patient now. You made another $51. 
And I think you need to take out the tray that you're with your O2 and let's, let's advance you using the next tray. That's another $51, okay? So this is the, the exploration and billing that we need to start. Now, when I consulted with uh, Randy Kieran at uh, Pristine Billing and uh, Brady Billing, um, they all said, well, this looks good. Okay, but Jeff, I'm not writing the check. So what we need to do is get active in this area and start trying to build these codes. Uh, this is the portal. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm just gonna blow through this. You know, you get a list of patients, you pick the circle, and then you um, pull up their study, and then this, is, this just organizes the stuff for you. So, oh God, I'm two over. Okay, so to finalize this, um, the, uh, it's titration. Okay, remote patient monitoring titration. Okay, think about what I talked about on the titration process. Okay, for $299, and that's the high price, for $299, think about the clinical yield that I've shared with you today. And then engaging the patients in the therapeutic and the titration process that, that now we have an active feedback loop. And then, hey, maybe you can make a couple extra bucks. You know, so to me, it's like, why would you, why would you say no? On, on, on something that sounds this good. So again, you know, the, the circle, it comes in, um, there's two sizes. And the reason that we got it, as you can see, this kind of stretches out. So there's a small and a large. Um, you can order them up or you, you can talk to me about it. Um, it, it works, the, the app works on an iOS and Android phone. Um, and uh, so that's it. So there's my info. Um, I, I wanted to do a couple things here before we wrap up. I'm going to share the info with us on the, the polling. And um, pretty even on the digital scanners. Pretty even. I, that's, uh, I don't know if that's, and then sometimes, see, I would have expected sometimes to be a lot higher. Um, number two, uh, do you take into account vertical dimension? And um, okay. All right, that's, that's, that's not too surprising there. That's all right. Um, do you select an appliance because the dental lab you use fabricates us? And that, was, that, that is a question to challenge, not your honesty, but a lot of times that's why we select an appliance. You, you work with the lab and they say, oh, we make these appliances. And they'll say, oh, that's the one I need that, that you make. So I was just curious. Um, about that as, as far as the selection process. <clears throat> this is my question. Do you find oral appliance titration a challenge? And a lot of you do, okay? Some of you don't. I think uh, that's, that's, you know, I'm not too surprised by that. Um, okay, this is a good question. How do you de determine your patient is at the optimal mandibular position? Okay, patient feels better, okay? Uh, no reported snoring. Okay, you order an HST. And it's a little bit lower than I thought it would be. And, and I thought oximetry would be, you know, I thought uh, it would be a little higher on the oximetry and the a, a, a HST on that one. So that's, that's, that's good info. Um, do you own a digital scanner? Okay. Well, I think that's probably the same mix as the people that don't use one. So. Um, now there's 10% of you out there that want to get one. I wish there was a digital scanner sales rep. Um, how many appliances per month do you place in patients? Well, there's some busy people out there. 11 to 15, 5% of you guys. That's pretty good. Not bad. Okay, so there's a lot of new newcomers here. So less than one. Um, there's a lot, 63%. Okay, so that's to me, that's a potential. I see that as a huge potential. Uh, number eight, what is the single biggest obstacle in treating more patients with sleep disorders? Huh. Okay, all right. 16% said other. Okay, so I'd be interested in hearing that. So if you checked other, go ahead and type in the chat or something because we'll get a transcript of that and write what the other challenges are that we didn't list there. Okay, because that, 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 that information's gold be honest. Uh, nine, do you screen all of your adult patients for oral cancer? Look at that, 89% said yes. 
okay? I'm not a dentist, so I, I don't know if that's a remarkable outcome or not. Uh, do you all, uh, do you screen all of your adult patients for OSA? Oh, okay, there is a discrepancy there. There is a, I would say, why not? I mean, on number 10, why is oral? Can I uh, mention that number 10 answers the problem on number um, seven? No, no, number six, number six, or number eight, rather. Uh, so, you know, number, number eight is single biggest challenge is uh, lack of patients, 26%, oh, yeah. Yeah. and then diagnosis. You can almost add those two together to get 37. Sure. Well, if you'll just start screening your patients and have testing in place, one in five of your patients has this problem. You shouldn't have a lack of patients out there. Drop the mic. Uh, drop the mic right there. <laughs> drop the mic. And we're done. No. So, I mean, so, so I mean, that that goes back to to my to my point. And you've just answered your own question. You need to have systems in place uh, to do this. Um, so, guy, so. something else I would ask is, you know, they're talking about um, one of the other problems is um, in number eight is um, they want to get started. You know, making sure that they have the right kind of training and everything like that. So. You know, you have outstanding, you know, you know, we've worked together on, on programs and lectures before, teaching down at Panky's Well. You've got incredible programs with DS3. And, and Persomnus is, is also interested in helping people get started so that if somebody does want to get started in LC Medicine, some of the people that aren't doing very many devices want to get started, and if you're going to take, like, one of Guy's classes or something that's out there, Persomnus does have a scholarship program. So if they email me, I can tell them more about that. You can tell them more about it, Guy. But it's a good way to get started and get into one of those courses and get up. Yeah, it's really, fun, really rewarding. It's a win-win-win. I mean, what I mean by that, it's a win for us, win for ProSamus, but it's also a win for the, the biggest win is the the dentist attending. So and the patients just, and their patients and the, and the patients, patients four wins. Yeah, I didn't even, didn't count that one because I mean you just commit to doing five devices that'll pay for the course, and if you can't find five patients to do this on it, then you know. You didn't show up for the course because number ten. That's number yeah, ten, right? Exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, email myself or Mark, and you can basically attend for free. And uh, uh, it's um, we just started doing that uh, very recently, so it's very exciting. Very recently, the ink is still wet. Yeah, I would like to add that um, number one, I screen every single patient that comes in my practice, every single one, and I always tell a patient I'm doing an oral cancer screening because they appreciate that. So why I'm doing the oral cancer screening, I'm also doing the airway screening at the exact time. And all my hygienists are trained to look at the uvula, the tongue, or at the, the dentition to look for malipotty. So when I come in, I go right ahead and do that with the oral cancer exam. It takes five more seconds to do it. Yeah. You get patience. And then I send home a tool that I have. It's called a Gym Pro. It's a screening monitor. Every single patient, I have seven of them, they go out every single day and come back in. That gets me either a snore guard, a night guard, or ready for a sleep appliance once they're diagnosed. Also, um, we have with practical sleep education that Jeff and I started, I do a lot of private training in my own office. I have dentists come here all the time and do shadow with me and we get see all sleep patients. I do a, some restorative, but our sleep side is packed with new patients, new consults, and I offer all free sleep consults, and they're packed with adjustments, placing it in appliance, just how we do it to show the dentist that it's simple to do. But your patients are right there in your office. Use your pipeline that you have, your own patients. You don't have to look, they're right there. You need to add to your health history. Do you snore? Have you ever had a sleep test? Do you wear a CPAP, or do you own a CPAP that sits on the dresser? You know, and then you get a copy of their sleep test, engage them in a conversation, and that's how it begins. So your patients are right there under your nose. You just have to look a little bit harder. And don't be afraid. Just know, you know, I think Guy said, or Mark, I think Guy said earlier, or Mark, I can't remember, that, you know, the patients are, you know, they're right there. All you got to do is talk to them a little bit and see how they feel. How do you sleep? Are you tired? You know, does your bed partner sleep with you? It's called sleep divorce. And so that's how you get started. You just have to engage and learn the verbiage. So anyway, that's what we Okay, um, there is a question real quick here. It's from, uh, isn't it true many states do not allow dentists to bill for HST or oximetry reading? If do, do you, okay, if do, do you just bump up the appliance fee? Hmm. 
um, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm in Georgia, and in Georgia and New Jersey, that's the only states that dentists are not allowed to write a prescription for a home sleep test. We cannot do it. So I do the screening test with the gym pro, then I send it to the doctors. But every other state, if you are in medical, you should be able to bill for the home sleep test. And then when you send the pulse ox or the circle home back home, your test, you could use it as a pulse ox code. So you should be able to bill. And what I do when I charge for my appliances, is I charge one price that first year and everything's included. You know, you just make sure their insurance is gonna pay for them. And so my answer to that question is one, my good friend, Mark Murphy taught me, it depends. That's the answer to all questions, right? Um, so I think I learned that from him 20 years ago. It really just depends on your billing model. I mean, you can go any way um, with it. Yeah, there are some state regulations, but you could bill for the consultation and not for the oximeter itself. So, um, you know, my personal belief is I, I don't charge for consultations because we're medical based referrals. And I think that kind of kills that. So you just got to have a system so you can do it either way. Uh, when you build, don't expect to get paid a lot from insurance companies for, for these pulse oximeters, if anything at all, but you can certainly bill the patient directly. Uh, and so that, that comes back to my point about billing, uh, having a billing company. And one thing I want to mention, when these pa you tell a patient, hey, I, I think you've got to need to have a sleep test, or they'll ask why you're doing this. Well, you know, they don't ask why you're doing oral cancer. They expect you to do that. When they say, why are you doing this? Here's a little verbal skill you can use. You can say, because we think breathing is important here. That, that's, you know, they look at you like, what do you mean? Well, you know, I don't think breathing's overrated. I use a lot too. It's just, you know, no one's ever said to me, you know, I just don't care about breathing. It's not something that I, you know, and they, they look at you kind of funny. Well, it's our job to look at this. They get a kick out of it. So try that with your patients. You know, why are you doing this? It's because we, we, we believe breathing's important. And uh, I think the emphasis I've taken over the last year or two is taken away from sleep. We talk a lot about sleep. It's really about breathing. And I think especially in today's COVID world, uh, if we talk about breathing, no one can look at you and say, I don't care if I breathe, you know, that, that, that's, it's not, um, not going to happen. So I don't know. Mark, you wanted to say something? I guess not. I thought, okay. Um, all right. So I think if there's no other questions and, um, looks like there's not, uh, I'm going to wrap up. I want to thank, uh, the attendees, there's still questions. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Uh, Mark, did you want to comment on that last question? No, I think uh, I, Guy's answer was good. I think that um, I, uh, I'm currently kind of in a bundled fee status, and like Guy, I don't charge for the consultation, stuff like that. We're currently investigating a more of a piecemeal a la carte kind of fee schedule if I were going to do that. So I can report more on that if I have some success with it. Okay. All right. So but I like the idea of I like the idea of your circle and getting paid for using that. So I like that. Yeah. You got my attention there, baby. Let me tell you. Uh, th that'll be interesting how that plays out. I'll, I'll keep yeah. you guys posted on that. Um, okay, so we're wrapping up. Uh, attendees, thank you. You're going to be getting a few emails from us. Uh, one on special offers. So uh, Prosomnus, Kettenbach, and DS3. Thank you guys. This has been a phenomenal webinar. I've enjoyed it. Uh, you guys made it possible. I, I, I'm grateful for your effort. Um, hopefully the attendees, you got something out of it. And, uh, you know, if, if you have any feedback or you're interested in any of the products, I'm going to be sending you an email with attachments and uh, just whatever you're interested in, uh, take a dive into it. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us.